I will ask if there is a motion to call the meeting to order. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we do have some adjustments to the agenda for tonight. Um, I'll go through them. Uh, we'd like to have the uh, GSA request first. Uh, that is an action item. And then have the public health data review. Uh, we'd also like to talk then about adjustments to the instructional model when community transmission exceeds the thresholds. Uh, Annie will cover that. Uh, the phase three presentation, April, we'll be doing that, and that is an action item. We have a Walmart Foundation grant and donation drive uh, action item. And then we have survey input um, that we would like to cover as well. Is that the rundown, Annie? That's correct. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so first, though, we will move into public comment. Again, for public comment, if you would like to participate, please raise your digital hand. Um, we will call on you and then we will ask you to unmute, which should allow you to unmute and um, uh, make your public comment. We have restricted video uh, as well as any sharing of, of screens for tonight's first security measures. but. Um, it looks like all of the ability to still raise your hand and participate in public comment is still functioning. So uh, I'll just pause to see if there's anyone who would like to uh, make a public comment. Okay, we have a hand raised by Will uh, Fadenhauer, I believe, and I will ask you to unmute. Will? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Thanks so much for uh, the chance to speak tonight. My name is Will Fadenhauer, and I'm a first year PhD student at UMass Amherst. Um, I moved to Hadley last August, and I'm here today because, like many other people across our country and the world, the events that have taken place uh, earlier this year have kind of shocked me into action to create a society that's more equitable, equitable and just for everyone. The systemic racism that's embedded in our society needs to be addressed, and then I want to make sure that the schools in my new community are taking the appropriate steps to do this. While I have not attended Hadley Public Schools, nor do I have children that are currently attending them, as somebody who plans to be a lifelong educator, it is of utmost importance to me that racism is addressed at all levels of our education system. Even beyond that, I believe addressing racism in all facets of our society is a moral obligation that we all share the responsibility of partaking. Since I've moved to Hadley, I've gotten involved with several community DEI initiatives, which have all introduced me to the school system here and in the process of doing so have demonstrated that racism is a present and persistent threat to the members of our community. I've heard firsthand accounts from people within the schools of racism that they've experienced and I'm determined to help create a school system where neither students nor faculty, nor staff continue to have these appalling experiences. While I am encouraged to learn of the passing of the anti-racism statement that was adopted last July, I want to ensure that the momentum and progress on these issues is not lost as we begin a new year. So my questions today are firstly, what specific concrete actions are being taken to reinforce the ideas that were put forth in the anti-racism statement? And secondly, how are you ensuring that these actions will be sustained and will not lose traction with time? Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Appreciate your public comment. I think those are great questions for us to put on a future agenda, um, given, it, and we don't typically interact during uh, public comment, but I think that your comment is well taken in terms of we passed a resolution, we have talked about a couple different updates um, and initiatives that have gone on, but these are very deliberate questions that I think we could address at a future update. And I'm looking at Humera because I know too that you've done a lot of work in this area um, and we've shared, um, uh, you shared a number of different events and activities um, that you've hosted and I would welcome the opportunity to spotlight this at a future um, meeting. Great, I agree, and I would love to also hear from the administration at that time what kinds of things we've been doing across the board. Great. 
Um, so thank you, Will, for um, that comment. I'm looking, I'm just going to pause here to see if there are any other public comments for today. Okay. Seeing none, uh, we will then move into the agenda. And I do want to just, again, thank everybody for attending this meeting. We really do appreciate your uh, participation. So thank you very much. Uh, okay, so our first topic is um, a presentation um, by the GSA, the request uh, that is for the um, Rainbow Crosswalk at Hopkins Academy. Annie, I will leave it to you to unmute folks that are doing the presentation for this. I believe, Kyle, that that is you. If I'm correct, I just ask you to unmute. Yep, so I can do it. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, Hi everyone. My name is Kyle Acne. Thanks for letting me speak. Um, I'm part of the GSA Hopkins Academy, and we would like uh, to create a rainbow colored crosswalk in the parking lot of Hopkins. And this would be the crosswalk that would, that's closest to the office entrance. And we're looking to have it very similar to the one in downtown Northampton. Um, this crosswalk would be a perfect way to symbolize a welcoming environment for the LGBTQ plus community throughout Hopkins and Hadley in general, uh, especially as it would be seen by many people every single day. And support for the community is very important as being a part of it can be very trying at times. So this would be a very simple and cost effective way for Hopkins to show its, to, to show its support for everyone, regardless of their identity. And the project has already been supported by Mr. Mish, who is supporting his assist assistance in the event that this would be approved. And that's all I have, if anybody has any questions. Hey Kyle, this is Paul Pfeiffer. Thanks for bringing this up. I really appreciate you uh, coming up or whomever came up with this idea. Can you just elaborate exactly where would it be again and how big you think it would be? Um, we don't really know how big it would be. It's, it would be the crosswalk that kind of crosses the parking lot that goes up to the stairs to the office entrance. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Kyle. This is Heather. I really do appreciate you representing this. Um, for our public, we do have a letter that was presented. Um, GSA is the Gender Sexuality Alliance. Um, and I think my only question would be just to make sure from the administration and facilities end that if the, I understand this is on property, not like a crosswalk on a town road or, or, um, or a, a state road by, you know, a uh, Route 9, for example, I just want to make sure any kind of permitting or um, permissions beyond our, you know, support of this are, are just obtained in terms of making sure that it's uh, visible to folks, that it's still a crosswalk that, you know, kids and others are in uh, as they cross through the parking lot, that, that all of, if all of those things are adhered, I'm definitely in favor of it. Thank you. Yeah, we'll definitely look at all of that. Hey, Kyle, this is Humera. I, um, I want to say that, um, that I love the idea. And uh, every time I um, cross that crosswalk in Northampton, I definitely feel like it makes a statement of um, inclusion about the community. And I think that is a strong signal to send um, in Hadley as well. So thank you and your colleagues for taking leadership here. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments or questions from the committee? No, I'm, I'll just say I love it. I love the idea. I think it's a great idea. I'm thinking about how we could potentially include that at Hadley Elementary School, so. <laughs> Agreed. Mm-hmm. I think it would be wonderful to have it at both buildings. Yes. Well, Kyle, maybe we can talk about that. That's great. So this, this does require um, an approval. Uh, so is there a motion to approve the uh, Rainbow Crosswalk at Hopkins Academy uh, to start? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Kyle. Appreciate it. Thank you, Kyle. All right, our next item, just going to my adjustments, the public health data review. Mm -hmm. Oops. Give me one second here. 
we go. Oh, I keep back. My computer's giving me grief. So needless to say, while you get the dashboard up, Annie, um, you know, we took the preemptive steps of uh, seeing where this was headed and realizing that um, before this meeting, we may have to need to go remote, which we did uh, based on the data from Thursday evening. Uh, and so as you can see, and it was um, communicated in terms of the county uh, transmission rate as or percent positive rate uh, and case count. And so um, we continue to keep this updated weekly. So with that, Annie, I'll turn that over to you. So essentially, I just wanted the school committee to have a chance to look at this and uh, you did receive it in the weekly update as well as this information went out in the email that informed families of uh, having students remote uh, starting on Friday of last week, Monday, today, and of course tomorrow, uh, based on the, the information that was in the dashboard last week. So both community transmission uh, indicators have moved into the red. That was all. So I think there is still an open question about um, this move back to all remote. Can folks hear me? Maybe Annie froze. I don't know. Um, I wasn't sure if it was me. With this move back to all remote um, for this close of, you know, the year, I think there's still a question about whether we would essentially, are we going to review this on a weekly basis to provide clarity about the back to you know, the new year, right, January 4th, when we come back, whether we're starting um, as remote continued or whether we will start with what we had as phase two. I think that's still an open question, is it not? Yeah, I think we lost Annie. Did, but that was my understanding, Heather. That it was still open, Jen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you know, to me, it's it's still premature to make that decision, but I, I think we'd all like to see the data go, <laughs> you know, trend back towards where we were, but based on um, where things are headed, I, I think we may need to, if we continue to see these uh, metrics at the county level, for sure, um, stay where we are, but what do others think? So the question is just generally what, what we think about the rates in the school. Um, well, I'm just, I think Paul, looking ahead to, um, it, we're obviously going to continue to discuss this and meet before the new year and the return um, for the 2021 school year is just figuring out, I'm assuming if we're staying in the red that we would continue with this remote model and not revert to the phase two model that we had. Is that folks understanding? Yeah, so long as it's in red, we stay in remote. Uh, so long as it has crossed our threshold, it stays uh, in remote mode until we see it reversing and coming back down to a threshold where we were, um, where we felt it was manageable. Uh, and I think Annie had some thoughts about that um, and the sort of um, indicators that she might look at for bringing it back for our review. I'm sad that she I think her, her internet must have cut out and she's probably rejoining and I, I'm sure we should look in the waiting room to, to see when she'll come back, but. I'm looking um, and yeah, she, her internet went out. So I'll say, I, I, I think that I know that's what we agreed to. I will say personally, I would reconsider the 3% uh, from a psychosocial perspective. I don't know if you all had a chance to dive into a lot of that stuff that Annie sent, you know, the CDC is showing that children 12 to 17 have a 31% increase in emergency department visits due to mental health reasons. I know, April, I think you're going to present some information on uh, student surveys. So, again, I will go back to that point that um, simply just looking at numbers of the virus is not sufficient to capture the the costs associated with our kids not being in school. Uh, and I'll point to New York, right? They recently closed schools when they hit their 3% metric, and then they reversed that. And they said, you know what, 3% is 
actually okay because we're not seeing in school transmission. I'll refer you to the that University of um, or the Philadelphia Hospital document that was sent out talking about looking to close schools when you get above five and start approaching nine percent. Um, that the, again, the benefits of schools being open outweigh the costs. So I think, frankly, from what we what we knew back when we said three percent was a good metric was was the best we could do. I think data around the world and even locally are showing 3%, I would say is too conservative given the cost it has for the children. Annie's information that you keep extracting show no in-school transmission. We've had what, 380 people attending or in schools in some fashion, we've had zero in-school transmission. Again, I think you have to weigh that risk associated with the cost to our children. That said, the complexity is it's not just the kids. I know we're, there's, a, there's risks associated with the adults in the room, and I think a lot about them. And I see that this rate, these rates of increases that are going up are due to behavior of adults, right, due to Thanksgiving, and I imagine that those same behaviors will probably be seen in Christmas. So I'm hopeful, but I'm fearful that the rates won't go down after Christmas and continue to be high. And I do understand that if we, the adults in the community, are not willing to curb our behavior such that the rates go down, is it fair for us to ask the teachers to share some increased risk because we're not curbing our behaviors and we're allowing large community increases? So I don't know what the right answer is. I do feel that 3% is not appropriate. I think New York was right. I think you see it in Europe where they've closed everything, schools. I think you see it by the CDC, by DESE, they're all saying keep the schools open. So I think we could be better than 3%. I think it's too crass and too uh, inappropriate a metric and we're not seeing in-school transmission. But again, I'm confounded because I, I worry for the teachers and I worry for the administration. So that's where I'm at. Thanks, Paul. Um, Annie, I see you're back with us. We opened up a conversation around, um, you know, confirming where we are now and our understanding that it's is still an open question as to whether that all remote phase that we're in now would continue at the beginning of the year. We already, um, we were talking about, you know, where we are with our metrics and um, it's not, not necessarily to assume that we would be back to a phase two as we were at the beginning of the year, but also, you know, not to assume that we'd be all remote because I think that that was still an open uh, discussion in terms of where we will go with the data. Uh, we also know that, you know, we discussed that we're going to be talking about phase three and that's further in January and gets at um, trying to address a number of those concerns about, um, you know, that we've discussed around face to face um, instruction and, and benefits to children as well. So, oh, goodness, tell me, all right. So, I, let me say again, I'm so glad in the meeting when we're finished with the vaccines and the end of Zoom, it will make me so happy, personally. <laughs> I am sorry, my internet is fussed out at the house. Um, and so I think, uh, based on what you started talking about, what would be helpful for me this evening is for the school committee to think through um, what essentially what I'm asking the school committee is does this does the school committee feel comfortable giving me the authority to make the determination about what instructional model we're in based on thresholds established by the school committee those you already have if you were to change those for any reason whatever thresholds you agree upon um, to make that decision and um, and then in how long of an increment so I had provided an example of, and I can, let me get it so others can see it as well. Um, I had provided some examples to the school committee of what that might look like, examples of what I'm talking about. So if, um, the school committee, assuming that the current, and that's, that's up for discussion with the school committee, but assuming the existing thresholds that we have on average daily incidence rate and on 
testing positivity rates, assuming those were as they are. And every Thursday evening when the data come out, we look at the data and if a community transmission indicator is in the red, then all students would be remote. Right, we see this example, the first example is if we were to do this on a week to week basis. Um, the 24th data comes out this Thursday, we're not in school the following week. On the 31st, if a community transmission indicator were, if we exceeded either of those thresholds, and we were read on either of those thresholds, the students would be remote for the week after that data came out, uh, those data came out, so the week of 1-4. Say on Thursday, January 7th, those community transmission thresholds, we still exceeded that, that red mark for testing positivity and average daily incidence. The following week, we would be uh, remote. And then let's say um, on 114, those uh, indicators were orange again. They'd moved out of the red. Um, that we would go back to where we were on Wednesday, the 16th of December. So resume where we were with in-person learning. Resume that phase two, beginning the following week of 118. Um, then let's say the following week we are back in the red. The week after that would be in the remote. That's what it could look like. This is just an example of what looking at the data each week might look like. Another way to look at this would be um, to say based on what we saw with Thanksgiving, and I did hear the end of your comments, Paul, and I, I really do appreciate that. And, and I want to underscore for the community that even in these past three days, um, we, we don't take pivoting to remote learning lightly. Um, and certainly the faculty and staff, um, it, those who, who think it's a responsible and safe thing to do, don't take that lightly. Our faculty and staff are one of very few districts in the Commonwealth who have offered, been a part of offering in-person learning for students since the first day of school. There are very few districts in the entire commonwealth that are offering in-person learning for 100 percent of their students i believe the last webinar i was at with the department of elementary and secondary education the number they had were 20 districts in the entire commonwealth that made in-person learning available for 100 percent of their students and our staff are willing to do that even though this back in august this this entire experience has been stressful has been nerve-wracking some of them come to work very concerned about their own health, what they might bring home, and they've shown up. They've shown up from day one. They've clearly implemented the safety protocols with fidelity because, to Paul's point, we don't see transmission in school. They are doing their part. They are working with their tails off to keep schools open and safe for everyone. And uh, yeah, the risk of sounding somewhat, uh, I guess, Pedantic. Um, this really, uh, the community can make different decisions. This is about community transmission right now. Um, and so at some point when community transmission starts just increasing at a precipitous rate like this, it's reasonable for people to ask as community transmission increases, and, and part of the studies that I sent out to the school committee, that 172 page document, did, did support the position that, that we've talked about, which is school transmission is not nearly what we feared it would be back in August. However, many studies also say when those community transmission rates start to go up at a very rapid rate, you can expect that community transmission will bring cases into the school. And so you, as you said, Paul, it is challenging. I struggle with the question of it, how fair is it when people are doing everything in their power to keep students safe and the workplace safe, and, um, and yet more could be done outside of school um, and to continue to, to ask adults then to just push forward and push through that. There's there's something about that that just, just doesn't feel right. So on the second model here, 
we one thing that the school committee could consider is um, to say to ourselves what did we see at thanksgiving and we saw that um, not everybody but certainly there were enough people in um, the commonwealth around the country and in the community that um, perhaps did not adhere to the recommendations that the governor set forth and we saw a we've seen this tremendous increase in community transmission and can we expect to see that after this holiday um, i think that's probably reasonable to assume that will happen even national news had indicated that airport traffic had picked up considerably just this past weekend so um, apparently people are still going to travel and still do all kinds of things so we could say that um, we will assume um, that we'll see similar behaviors in a similar pattern and therefore that we should plan to have students learning remotely the first week of January. Um, that also takes into consideration, I'm assuming BPH will publish the data on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, but there could be issues with the holiday. I'd hate for us not to have it, although we could always use the previous week's data if they did not um, publish it. So in this scenario, and then this, these examples just then say uh, that first week students are remote and then we go to this thing of looking at the data every Thursday and if the community transmission indicators are in the red, students would be remote the following week and if they are orange, we would return to phase two. And then another example is looking at this in two week chunks, which I will admit gets a little bit confusing in terms of the data changes midway. But if, if um, the school committee felt that there was some sort of value in looking at this in, in two week chunks instead of week to week, I tried to show what that might look like in terms of a schedule. If the data did this, what, what we could expect. Um, and in all of these examples, um, in all of those scenarios that, remember we hit the pause button going to phase three because we were seeing an increase in community transmission, things were ticking upward at a fairly rapid rate. And um, we said orange was kind of pause, right? It wasn't, it didn't say let's progress, it said let's pause. So we would come back and, and wanna be um, seeing a, a, a decrease in community transmission and squarely in the orange for two consecutive weeks before moving into phase three and Ms. Camus is going to present on what phase three might look like at Hopkins after this discussion. Um, in terms of athletics, one question might be, um, well, if students are learning remotely, should uh, we proceed with athletics? A fair number of schools in the fall were remote and they had an athletic season. Um, the, our local conference that's moved the start date of the winter season to January 11th they could potentially decide to push that back even further. And the school committee could determine that they wanna think about this a bit more and um, we could schedule a meeting for January 4th, the first Monday in January, and then make a determination about how we wanna proceed with athletics when students are learning remotely, like the practices, we suspend practices during remote weeks or um, that's something the school committee would could discuss. So, my hope is that the school committee would decide whether or not to give me the authority to select the instructional model for the time period determined by the school committee. I, those examples I just went through were examples like a week at a time, in two week periods, or um, immediately after break saying we would have students learning remotely for a week and then look at the data a week at a time. Um, and then in accordance with the thresholds for community transmission and school transmission previously set by the committee, unless you were to change those. Um, and then at some point deciding whether or not winter athletics occur when students are remote. Um, and then uh, anything which is not, I'm not asking the school committee to discuss, but anything pertaining to uh, um, agreements concerning staff reporting to buildings uh, would be, uh, something that would be discussed in executive session as an aspect of negotiation. Thanks for walking through that, Annie. I think what, um, Paul, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things you're also proposing is us potentially revisiting what our metrics are, which isn't necessarily part of what Annie's outlined, but 
would be taken into consideration if we do you know, give uh, Annie the authority to select the instructional model based on whatever those, that updated metric is. So I think, I, I mean, I think one of the things you were proposing is, is our 3% too, too low of a threshold? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm proposing that we revisit it, Heather. I, I do think it's too low. I think the data are clearly indicating, you know, whether it's New York or Europe, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, the policy lab document you said out, Annie says, encourage continued reopening of schools in the absence of evidence of linked transmission occurring in the schools. We don't have any, there is, there is that. We have an absence of evidence of linked transmission, so we're not seeing linked transmission. And in the absence of rapidly accelerating community transmission, that is quickly approaching or reaching 9% or greater test positivity, 9%. You know, CDC says 5%, we're at 3%. So I just, we're overly conservative in that regard. Um, so that's the risk that, <clears throat> but I, I weigh that, and this is where I don't know where I, I fall on, what Annie was talking about, the risk to the administration and the teachers. And if we have, or we're seeing community spread because of community behavior, is it fair to say to the teachers, hey, you take some increased risk potentially um, because of community behavior. And that's, that does seem inappropriate, as you had said, Annie. So I'm weighing that. But maybe it's, to me, a little bit more flexibility that the 3% is a, not a black or white on and off switch, where Annie says we're at 3.09 like we are now, and therefore it's all done. Maybe it's a bit more nuanced. You look at what the other factors. The one I, I had actually thought with our three factors, the one that was a black and white switch was in-school in transmission. I thought the other two were more advisory and not uh, on and off switches. Thanks, Paul, for clarifying that. And I, I guess a question to the committee is, you know, in this proposal, really whether we want to, as a committee, give that authority to select the instructional model to Annie. Uh, I mean, I'd like to have some dialogue around that. I can tell you personally, I feel like you know, Annie, this is Annie's workforce, right, that she is working with. She is on the ground there. Um, and I think out of anybody here, the, you know, closest to, along with her administration, um, what is going on in the building. So I, I think I do feel comfortable with that decision-making process, although I, I think it is our responsibility to weekly be reviewing these data as we've, as we've been committed to doing. But what do you all, what do you all think about this? So I, I'd like to, I'd like to comment on that. And I'd like to just um, emphasize again, Annie's point that, you know, we do know um, that children tend to be less affected in general by this virus and numbers in the community in general are going up, rising quite quickly. We do have a responsibility, right, to our, our teachers, our staff, and the community as a whole. Um, <clears throat> and so I wouldn't want, um, even if our children are getting the virus at very low rates, I wouldn't want to be the reason or a vector as to why the virus is spreading. And I think that we owe that to, again, our staff and our community as a whole to not make a situation worse. Um, as far as um, as far as giving the authority or whatnot to Annie, I, I think it's a good idea, but I think we should talk about kind of in what increments um, that would happen and how quickly we would consider shifting in 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 the phases or changes. And <clears throat> one thing that I was thinking about because I was thinking about this before the meeting is um, kind of wondering if we're flip-flopping back and forth a lot for the students. How does that impact them on an emotional level and just a stress level in general? Like one week you're remote, one week you're in school, one week you're remote. Because you're right, the 3% is a, is a cutoff along with the um, incident rate, because we're looking at that too. But you know, if right before school our number goes down and we're at 2.98 and they go back to school and then the following week the numbers go up and we're at 3.2 we're at this we're at that so I think really 
<clears throat> looking at rate, uh, and I don't know how to define this because I don't know, I, I haven't looked at that recently to know if there's really good scientific data out there to make a good suggestion about what a rate of increase or decrease is appropriate to consider. But I'm just saying, I just, I just worry about too much back and forth and you know, the harm that that might cause to the students, but also to parents, especially in, in the elementary school, trying to coordinate that, having it kind of back and forth. So I don't know if we can find a way to, I mean, I certainly will do research I can about finding out if there's, you know, a certain rate of increase or decrease that we should be looking for as we're considering these transitions, rather than just saying we're at 3%, our daily incidence rate is X, now we're remote. We're here, we're here, okay, now we're back. You know, should we really be looking at our trends a little bit more? I know that makes it less definitive maybe, but, and I don't know the answer of what that would be. I don't know the number. I don't. Um, and maybe it's not a concern. Maybe people aren't worried about that and they want their kids back as much as possible and they go back and forth. I don't know. The only other question that I had that um, at some point that I'd like to just talk about is the numbers in Hadley, looking at our numbers going up. For Hadley, we had quite a few cases last, last week reported. Um, and I'm just curious, um, without divulging anything specific, and I guess this is towards Emma, you know, is it something that's kind of isolated or is it really kind of just widespread all over the place that there really is no correlation to one specific area that we're able to say, okay, we're not worried about this? Because we kind of talked about that. Like, well, if it's all, you know, if half the cases are in a nursing home, you know, are we as worried about it? Probably not. But if it's kind of no real pattern to it, then it might be more concerning. Those are my thoughts. Emma, I'm gonna um, allow you to unmute here, thanks. Yay, I'm unmuted. So Tara, I think that's a great question. Um, when our numbers came out at 24 cases, they were not just strictly isolated at a long-term care facility. Uh, we are seeing them throughout our community, um, multi-generational homes, um, people who uh, live in <clears throat> both homes and apartments and, and kind of throughout various settings. I think one thing I, I do want to highlight too is, well, overall Hadley's numbers have been low. I think everyone knows how many restaurants and businesses we have in Hadley and how many people come in to shop. Uh, if, if individuals are employees of facilities that are located in Hadley, but they're not residents, we only get notified of those cases if, they're, if we get notified directly by the employer. Um, and, and that is happening. We are seeing cases in restaurants, in restaurant workers, in all of our, well, not all, I shouldn't generalize like that. A great majority of all of our retail stores have had cases um, on and off, uh, and it's here. So I think even if our residents' cases have not been quite alarming, um, Hadley innately is kind of the vector where that transmission is happening. Um, and I, I know that's challenging to kind of think about logically in a way. Um, I think that this winter is going to be very, very hard uh, for all of us. And I think mental health and well-being and care is very important um, for us all to kind of be cognizant about uh, while we make these decisions, not just for our students, but like everyone's been talking about here, our whole school family, uh, staff families as well in our community. So I think these are really, really tough decisions that none of us really expected to have and come to. I think when most people join the school committee or I know from myself when I joined the Board of Health. Um, but these are trying times. And I think, Paul, yes, I, I wish that we had simple answers that we could kind of go on at this time, but I, 
I think that's one of the challenges is that we're learning more about this virus each day. Um, we are coming and the answers and the plans that we had yesterday might might be totally different tomorrow when we know no more information um, and and being accepting of that possible change in the future with where we're going to need to go is just something that we have to continually be open to so that's what question. i got yeah um so are you noticing any trends in age groups mm. so this week we're having um, a larger trend with our um, I call them wise populations or older folks in town um, and not just in Hadley but throughout the state we are starting to see uh, transmission within uh, elder communities long-term care facilities nursing facilities as well um, but we are seeing multi-generational households have transmission with this. We have had a two-year-old in Hadley that has been tested positive, as well as many, um, I think the majority of our, of our cases right now are actually the kind of the, the demographic that I'm seeing in this room, in this uh, technological room, um, kind of the 30s to 50s age right now are the ones that we're really seeing um, kind of come through. Thank you. Yeah. We're seeing less college students right now, but you know, they're not around. They went home, the majority of them, so. Does anybody else have any other questions? No, Ethan, were you gonna add something though? No, I, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I, I think I, I kind of shared what everyone else has said already. I, I do think we need to, I mean, one, if, if, if we're answering the question of, of whether or not we should give Annie the, the ability to make those decisions, I absolutely agree. I just, I do think we need to much in, in the way that we just spent a, a lot of time, or at least I know April and her team have spent a lot of time revisiting phase three in Hopkins. I think we should be revisiting I don't know if we revisit the metrics or revisit how we look at the metrics and look at the data. Um, again, I think I share all of Paul's feelings. At least that's kind of what I wrote down before this meeting um, in the sense that without the school transmission, I still think that that we're in a really good place. And, and to, to Annie's point, we've been one of the only games in town and we've done it really well. And I think that's a compliment to everybody involved, you know, teachers, administration, but also families. You know, there is community transmission, but you know, that community transmission hasn't found its way into the schools yet. Um, and that's, that's a positive. Um, and so I just, I just think we have to, we have to maybe look at it different because what we know now is different than what we knew in August when we made, or September when we made these decisions. Um, I don't know that I have, obviously don't have the answer for that right now, but I, I just feel like, we have to adapt and change where needed um, because I, I guess I don't like the idea of doing a remote one week in person one week and kind of flip flopping back and forth. I feel like to Tara's point, that's not good on anybody, including the parents. Um, and, and I think we just have to be a little bit more open to uh, maybe doing things not necessarily hard based on metrics that we have established. So it sounds like um, in looking at the metrics that we have established, thinking about whether there's more of like a hierarchy, right? So really seeing that school transmission data as being kind of the, the utmost importance, right? Is what I'm hearing that that's, I mean, cause that is direct in, in our community. Um, yeah, Emma, please. One second. There you go. I, I, yeah, so uh, just when we're reviewing data, I just want people to be, um, and I think it's hard uh, to remember that data is a past experience. Those are things that have already happened when we're reviewing statistics. That's not planning for the future. So it's nice to review data, but when we're, if we're already seeing school transmission, then that's already started to occur. Um, and in pandemic planning, especially, 
Um, it's just important to not just be reactive and responsive. It's also important to like do all the mit great mitigation and planning efforts that we have in our schools, um, but just something to be aware of. I just didn't want us to miss that point. Thank you, Heather. No, that's a great point, Emma. And I, I, I know too that, you know, um, we consulted you as well at the beginning when we were thinking about these metrics. I'm wondering if we kind of need to go back to that consultation phase of just thinking about do we need to examine things like rate of change i think tara you brought that up in terms of um, hadley's cases for example or maybe emma that was you that brought it up in terms of just growth over the last um, two weeks four weeks actually and so i i just i think i would appreciate more insight from um, somebody like emma that has the bigger picture view, but also the data view to th be thinking about, okay, if these are our metrics that we and our thresholds we have established, how can we examine them, you know, in the best way possible without upending everybody's lives every week or, you know, because I think we're trying to balance both things, right? We don't want to put people in harm's way, but if we don't have evidence that, that putting people in the buildings would be putting them in harm's way, is it better to put them in the buildings? But if we feel like we have to revert back to remote and we were just in person for a week, is that again upending people's lives after you know, switching back and forth? I just wanna add in, I, I just, just for clarification, I'm not, I'm not making a suggestion we change our current metrics. Um, I'm just making a suggestion that if it's something where it's going to become Annie's decision, um, that we look at something like rate of change so that we're not having children moving back and forth and we're not shuffling kids back and forth, that it's something that it's very clear to her and it doesn't become stressful or ambiguous in any way or challenging in any way for her to know how to make that change or when to make that change and that we're making it, as Emma had pointed out, in more of a proactive decision in looking at trends rather than something that's more retroactive saying, well, here's where we were. So I'm just suggesting that we look at the rate of change, look at the trends to better be able to decide because if a number goes down again to 2.98, and it's, you know, say this week it's 2.98 and it was 3.09 last week, we don't really have a trend yet, right? It's just a little dip and next week it could come up a little bit higher. And that's what you see on a on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You're seeing numbers as they come in for the state and they may go down a little bit, they may go up a little bit, but you got to look at that overall trend line to see where you're going rather than just looking at one or two data points. So that, that was my suggestion was really just that, just so we don't have kids, you know, going back and forth or trying to work to alleviate that, that we set something to be able to look at trend lines so that it's it's easier for her to, to say that it's the right way to go and she's not sending out an email every single Thursday night saying your kids are remote, okay, your kids are in school, okay, your kids are remote. It just, it feels more stressful um, than it needs to be and I, I just, I, you know, and I think I just want to say this just because I know that it does get really, it, it gets overwhelming. I think it's overwhelming for school committee. It's overwhelming for administration. It's overwhelming for teachers and kids and everybody. I mean, my kid knows more about COVID than I probably would like him to at eight years old, really. Um, but I just, I, as long as we've been in this and as tiring as it is, you know, and as daunting as the winter it is going to be, I was right, it's just, it's not going to be easy to continue it. <clears throat> but we, we do have that light at the end of the tunnel. I do believe that as we continue of being able to vaccinate, they're vaccinating in the hospitals like crazy. I mean, the clinics, for instance, at Cooley are, are full. They don't have enough vaccine to go ahead and make more appointments. They've had to stop making appointments for staff because they don't have enough vaccine yet. So it's moving and I, I think it's gonna move rapidly. And I do think that we just have to get over the hump of the winter and we're gonna start seeing positive trends. And I, I do, I believe personally that we're gonna start seeing positive trends and we will see them in this school year. But I just wanna make sure that we're being careful through the winter as best as we can as we're shifting 
with these numbers of going back and forth, you know, from home to remote. And if the discussion is to change the metrics, then I would ask that it's not that we're, you know, it, it's that we meet to reevaluate and look at current data and look at current research to determine if it's something we need to consider rather than saying we're going to make that change. I think we need to really have a discussion. I think the next few weeks are going to be telling too. So I agree with a lot of what you said, Tara. So maybe if I can summarize what I've been thinking. So I, I, I agree with giving Annie and the administration the ability to make a decision. I agree it can be um, on a weekly basis. I agree that it should be more consistent though. The seesaw back and forth, while probably not so difficult for me with um, high school age children is probably much harder with uh, the parents of younger children. So to the extent we can avoid that. I like the idea of what you said, Heather, about that hierarchy that's sort of, and we, we've been talking about this for a while, right? In school transmission is like the key factor. If that happens, we need to really reassess, shut things down. But the 3%, I don't think that's the right number as a black and white remote, not remote switch. Cause I, I, I think it was a good estimate, conservative estimate months ago. I think what I would argue if we were to set a black and white switch now, I'd change that number based on what the CDC, what DESE, what Europe, what New York, what they're all saying. Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, they all are advocating a much higher number, five to 9%. So if we were to follow the science, we would elevate that number. But I, I like what you, what I interpreted what you said, Tara, was let's not, I wouldn't use it as a black and white switch, but just to indicate it's, it's, it's a yellow light, it's a cautionary thing. Hey, we need to pay attention. It might mean we go to remote if we're seeing a trend or, and a trend might be less of, I mean, we know why the numbers are high now. Everybody predicted the numbers would go up after Thanksgiving, they went up. Everybody's predicting they're gonna go up after Christmas, they'll probably go up. So the trend is for, foreseeable. Right? Are they going to go down in February and March? Well, I certainly hope so, because there isn't a uh, unique event that will bring people together and, and allow them to maybe bend the rules a little bit. So it, hopefully it'll go down. And as you said, Tara, we're going to start seeing more vaccinations. We live in a community where there's a lot of educators, a lot of essential workers, a lot of hospitals, probably disproportionately so. So we'll probably see the effects of vaccination faster than others. We have a lot of students. Right, so our community probably should see that decline quickly. I'm hoping it's fast because I have a senior who would like to have some of his senior year back. Uh, and so I would say, Annie, you, know, you, can, you have that ability, uh, but just pay attention and don't consider the 3%, like Tara said, if it's 2.98, take in the context. Do you think it's gonna keep going up? Are we having another spring break maybe? Uh, you know, those are another milestone to pay attention to. But over time, are we seeing that it's just dancing around that two or three percent? Well, and we're not seeing any in-school transmission, as we frankly haven't really seen in the region much, then don't use it as a hard and fast reason to, to, to go all remote. That seems like too heavy handed. So I would, and I would leave that discretion to you. We still have these weekly meetings, we can talk it out, um, but I would say, the hard part is going to be for the parents to say if it has to 3.09 like it is now versus 2.98, it's not quite clear exactly what's going to happen. But maybe that's that cost is worth the benefit of being able to have our kids in school a little bit longer. I'm, I'm supportive of that, Paul. I think you were able to verbalize what I was thinking. So I really appreciate you recapping that. I, I want to. Um, articulate something that just reminding ourselves of um, the work we did to um, imagine our population, our population, only 20% of our population in Hadley has have children in the schools. Uh, I really like Emma, how you described our wise population. Um, we have a lot of elderly people who live in our town um, and Hadley is a vector for that transmission. I think COVID has been a very politicized issue and the CDC has taken uh, its cues from politics at the top. 
And I, I feel as though there's data coming out that says uh, a high threshold is safe. There's also data that comes out that says in under 15 minutes, people are seeing transmission from across a restaurant. Across a restaurant. Our restaurants in Hadley are not closed. People are eating indoors. I, I would feel uncomfortable pulling a bait and switch on our community. I would feel more comfortable deciding that we were going to have a discussion around metrics at a certain date and come prepared with data as we did over the summer. Um, I wouldn't want to um, take what we've provided to our community as somewhat of a certainty, right? Certain set of thresholds. And then like, once we didn't like what we saw that we changed, that we decided, oh, that doesn't matter to us anymore. Let's just like not hold fast to these metrics. I feel that we, if we are, are gonna have some integrity around what we said, then we should have some kind of rigor in making the adjustments. And um, so I like the idea of looking at rates of change. And I also like the idea of putting it in Annie's hands, whom I trust to look at the nuances of when we cross thresholds. But I don't think that tonight we're ready to um, change up our metrics because we're not happy with what we see. And I have a senior too. Sad that their senior year is going the way it is, but not willing to compromise the community's health because of his potential senior year. I think folks are in agreement, Humera, that we're, we're not proposing to change the metrics. Um, we, we're looking to examine the metrics, you know, more fully with considerations around um, rates of increase, but also which metrics are the ones that are of um, the greatest, uh, I guess, really closest proximity to our students is one way to put it. I just want to remind us too that when we had this conversation, when we first started talking about it, there was a lot of conversation about not having just one simple metric. And I, I was an advocate of that, not having the one metric, which is why we've utilized a second metric. So I just want to make it clear to people who are listening that, you know, Annie didn't make the decision to go remote because we hit 3% and we went above 3%. It was 3% in addition to the daily incident rate. So we are looking at two separate metrics on a regular basis when she makes that decision. And we did talk about, um, and I don't, I don't know that it's a hierarchy, rather it is just a hard stop that if we started seeing school-wide transmission that the school would close. That's kind of something that we talked about separate, right? Like that was just a hard stop. We review the metrics, those two metrics, the, the incident rate and the percent positivity on a regular basis. And so it's my understanding that if one hit and the other didn't, that doesn't mean the school would close. You have to hit both of those metrics for it to be something that closes. We have to have school-wide transmission or evidence of school-wide transmission for the school to close. And then that other thing that we kind of were looking at and that we kind of pulled Emma in, thankfully she's so helpful to us, is um, looking at the town information to determine do we really need to worry about spread and that was kind of if you were a little bit more subjective measure because it's something that we might not be worried about at all or it is something we might be worried about. So I just want to reiterate that. Thanks Tara. So what I'm hearing, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm hearing that we want to continue to review these weekly. We're committed to doing that. We're sticking with the metrics we have in place uh, threshold wise, but we would also like to, when these data are reviewed, we're going to look at rate of increase. So increase of counts in, in Hadley, increase of test positivity rate. That's all there in, in the worksheet. We can see it. Uh, and you reference it in your superintendent emails, Annie, from week to week, what, what's um, changed. And then I, I think what I'm hearing is that, yes, in terms of um, placing, you know, the uh, authority, I think is how you worded it, the, the authority to select the instructional model for the time period um, in, you know, that that would be under Annie's purview as superintendent of the district. I, I'm hearing that folks are comfortable with that. I think we're all remaining connected to this. 
no one is saying we're checking out and Annie, it's all yours, have fun. Um, you know that we're, <laughs> we are all committed to reviewing this, interacting with you um, and just brainstorming about where we are and what it looks like. Is that a fair synopsis for folks? I don't wanna speak for everybody, but I think that's where we landed. I just have a couple of questions, if it's okay. So I just wanna make sure, and we can also, we've scheduled an executive session for the 28th. We can also add a regular meeting to that, if it makes sense, because I do agree. I have zero interest, and I know you're not suggesting this. I have zero interest in this becoming a unilateral superintendent decision. My thinking is, I want the authority to execute a shared decision. Um, there is no way of approaching this that will make everyone equally happy, equally comfortable, or help them to feel equally safe. So if I were someone uh, in the community or in, in our school district an employee, if I'm a person who wildly disagrees with the position that the superintendent of school committee has taken thus far, which those, those people have every right to, to criticize decisions and question those decisions, I would feel incredibly uncomfortable if what I thought was one person gets to kind of interpret things and, and just decide. And I know that's not what people are saying, but this is why I want it to be crystal clear. And if we can't get to that degree of clarity tonight, we can revisit it next week. So I hear people are comfortable with granting me the authority to execute a shared decision. I believe what I heard that that shared decision is the threshold the time being remain. If school transmission is present, that is a no-brainer. Schools have to close when school transmission is present. That's set forth by DPH, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and that's just good practice. So we shut down schools. The amount of time that they need to be shut down is delineated by DPH and DESE, and it's not a fixed amount of time. It depends upon the extent of transmission. It depends on what cleaning, disinfecting, mitigating strategies are required. So it could be shutting down a portion of a school, shutting down an entire school, shutting down the district if it's in both buildings, and then the extent of cleaning, disinfecting, and contact tracing then dictates um, how long a school is remote in the wake of school transmission. When it comes to community transmission, I hear the school committee saying, we're not changing the thresholds that were previously established the one average daily incidence rate uses a recommendation from Harvard School of Global Health that at 25, where Harvard School of Global Health at that point, uh, 25 or more per 100,000, their words are um, that stay at home orders are recommended and um, community transmission is an issue. That's from Harvard School of Global Health, not my words. And testing positivity, uh, the school committee had set that at, at 3%, not in the August, it was the WHO that it said 5%. There were other places um, that questioned whether or not that was too high and the school committee landed on 3%. But you're saying that it's both of those, not one of those. And then in terms of the, um, and then you can come back and correct anything that if, if both of those were in the red, that that would be an indication um, that we would go into uh, remote, and I want to be that clear for families. Um, I also, and, and I appreciate what we're saying about trends. I know that we can, you know, we can see, whoops, I messed something up here. We can see trends, we can, um, we can, we can see trends, and uh, I think it's important to, as, as, Challenging and arbitrary as it may feel, like if one week it's 2.9, next week it's 3.09, what is that difference? Um, I, I do think that, that for the sake of clarity, so people understand, they know what to expect. We can't predict what will happen, but they know what to expect. But there's some value in saying at this point, this is what happens. Because if we use the terms as trends, um, granted, it didn't hit our thresholds, but look at our lines again. If we were just using trends, we, we would have moved a long time ago. Um, so, so that it, trends is, is it's, I'm not saying it's not important to look at, I'm just saying that it, it lends itself to a degree of ambi ambiguity um, with which I'm not entirely comfortable. 
so I want to take it into consideration, but I think there's a value in saying, in having some if then statements. And I know it may sound like I am trying to overly simplify a complex thing like a pandemic, but I, I do think people, um, I do think there's some advantage for people understanding what to expect and when to expect it. If, it's, if I see this, I can expect this will happen. You've also talked about, which I understand, trying to avoid flip-flopping. So that would mean, and again, school committee could say, we're going to think individually, come back and finalize publicly um, next week. But if you're not going week to week, then we have to establish what that interval is. That might feel more arbitrary if we're just saying, well, we're going to remain remote regardless of what the data say for the sake of consistency, or we're going to remain here regardless of what the data say for the sake of consistency. I'm not saying there isn't an argument to be made for that, but remember um, that we can't safeguard against things changing very quickly and, and changing from one thing to the next. So by way of example, and Emma, truly, if I'm off on this, jump in and correct me. If I see community transmission rates going up, 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 and again, even if I control for school transmission, my community transmission rates go up, the likelihood that the community is now going to introduce this into the school, whether it's because of household spread, multi-generational spread. Now I'm going to have positive case count in schools. When positive cases go up, thankfully the Board of Health is, is incredibly helpful to us in terms of doing widespread contact tracing. But within the building, and because we know the schedule, that's the school nurse, the principal, and me. So now you have cases going up, contact tracing alone, if community transmission, you can have increased case count in school without having school transmission. But every time you have a, a case in school, it has to be contact traced. So I just want people to know, no matter how hard we try in the winter, things changing like that, disruption, there is no way to avoid it. The one way we could have avoided it, which I'm glad we didn't, I, I'm proud of the decisions we made. They were incredibly hard. One way you could avoid it is just keep everybody remote this entire time. We're almost halfway through the school year. We've been able to bring 80% of kids back to Hadley Elementary five days a week. School is open for, for everybody. We're working hard to make it attractive for seven through 12 students. Like I'm so proud of the fact kids and families have been served when nobody else around us has been able to do that. And um, things are probably going to get pretty disruptive, no matter what, no matter even it, there's no magic interval we can pick that we could say families you'll have no disruption in January. As long as that community transmission rate is going up, up, up. I, I don't know. And again, I'd invite you to correct me, Emma, and I mean that sincerely. I just don't see where we draw a moat around the schools and that doesn't have any impact on case count in schools. Oh, did I not do what I was supposed to do? Sorry. Emma. No, you did. You did. I'm just zoomed out like the rest <laughs> of us. Um, no, I think you really hit the proverbial nail on the head, Annie. I mean, even without the school transmission that we've had, which I am so proud of the Hadley community and the school community that to have us set up. Sorry, that's my phone. Um, it's a duck who likes ducks. I do. Um, I'm so proud that we haven't had school transmission and that's because of all our, our, of our efforts. But even though we haven't had that school transmission, um, Annie, the school nurses, us as Board of Health, we have worked really diligently with each one of the cases that has affected our students um, and our families. Um, and, and it is time consuming. Um, are there are they meaningful efforts? Absolutely. Do we want to be there for our, our families and make sure that um, that people have food on the table and that they're getting the care that they need um, and that they have shelter and clothing? Things that I think a lot of us in this room, um, I know myself, take for granted every day that I easily have those things around me 
And I think a large amount of Hadley um, has those gifts, but there are people in our community that do struggle. Um, and I don't want to forget about them. And that's where I know the Board of Health and, and the school department has really come together during this time. Um, I could talk for hours about that, but no one wants to hear me talk forever. Uh, but I just, um, I think it, it, right now at this moment, I think staying remote is is the best decision that we can make. And it's a really, really tough decision and a hard decision. Um, but from a public health standpoint, I think it's where we need to be for our community. So Annie, going back to what you were saying, you were saying the, um, are you asking for the clear metrics? I, you covered a lot yes. of topics. Well, yeah, what, I, heard, I heard that you're saying both on community transmission or in the red or remote, school transmission is a given. And I just, and you're looking at weekly intervals. Is that what I'm hearing or longer than that? And to Emma's last comment, are we suggesting that um, we should start that first week, the week of January 4th, that we should continue to be remote? One question, do we continue with remote learning the week of January 4th? On the data that we get on that Thursday, which is January 7th, right? Or if I seven, on January 7th, we look at that data. What I'm hearing you say is that both community transmission indicators were in the red. We would continue remote learning, but I want to be clear with the community that the intervals that we're talking about, you can expect this to happen on a week to week basis. You can, and if the school committee isn't saying that or isn't ready to decide that piece, then I think we should schedule next Monday, not just executive, but regular and get very, very clear on that. Um, those would be my thoughts. And that's just for me to be able to do my job well, to do well by the school committee, well by the staff and well by families. I need to be very clear and not have, um, it can't be subject to interpretation. My interpretation, that isn't a shared and uh, are well communicated, you know, what I'm interpreting and how I'm likely to interpret it. So me personally, I think that based on looking at Thanksgiving and knowing how things kind of transpired and looking where we are right now, I think that we can, make a reasonable expectation that numbers are not going to drop drastically. And that I personally, although I know it's not a desirable thought for a lot of people, I would be in support of us being remote that first week back to trend the numbers. So that way at least parents can have some sort of um, <clears throat> expectation for that first week back and not have it to be a decision on Thursday the 31st an email coming out and finding out four days later hey my kids are remote at least there's a reasonable expectation to know that okay I have to plan on my kids being remote now and then we'll see what happens that next Thursday the sixth or seventh or whatever that number is um, at least they can plan just given where we are right now that would be my suggestion I'm supportive of that approach. I think it, it is, it's, I mean, underlying all of this, we have also said from the beginning that one of our goals was clarity to families, clarity to the community in communicating as quickly as we could what the plan was and all of the aspects of that plan. To me, the, this approach would be the clearest approach that is, here's where we are now going into this break. We intend to restart in this model and examine it that Thursday of that first week. In support of, uh, of that plan as well. That sounds reasonable to me. So then Annie, on the, the seventh, you would assess the data and if there's in, well, there wouldn't be in school transmission. So if there is both, if both of those community metrics are triggered, then we stay on remote for another week and reassess the next, the following Thursday. If only one of those community metrics is above our threshold, then they would return to in school phase two, essentially. Go ahead, wait to hear from the school committee on that. 
That's my understanding. And then we had talked about phase three beginning January 19th. Is that correct? Potentially? Uh, 18th. Yeah. However, one thing I would say with that is, um, remember we hit the pause button. So I, I do kind of, I want to maintain the logic that we had when we delayed the start of phase three, we delayed the start of phase three because somebody remind me of roughly when we made that decision, but I'm gonna put this back up here. We, we delayed the start of phase three because we were starting to see this. I don't know if you see my little arrow or not, right? We were starting to see this increase, so we put things on pause. And I think that it is reasonable to say you return. And I had suggested you have you want to see two weeks of we're headed down. We're not just we're not just holding steady, um, and then move into phase three. That was my suggestion there because again the logic of why we hit the pause button was because we were starting to see an escalation, and so the signals in that escalation weren't that we should be progressing forward. Again, I just want to underscore uh, for any Hopkins students who are listening to this and feeling really disappointed or frustrated, um, I want nothing more than for them to have an enjoyable experience. Their teachers and the staff want nothing more than that. Um, but I also, well, everything we've said, you know, um, I also want to be responsible. Yeah, I, I don't mean to pick on the language, Annie. It's not just mm -hmm. about enjoy, you know, enjoyment. Mm -hmm. So it's psychosocial, the CDC mm -hmm. information, and I tend to believe the CDC information, though I understand how some people are jaundiced and jaundiced side towards it. Mm -hmm. A 31% increase in ED visits due to mental health in 12 to 17 year olds. 24% increase visits since April of this, this year uh, from five to 11 year olds. Those are people taking their child to an emergency, emergency department in the midst of COVID because they have mental health concerns. Ide suicide ideation rates are skyrocketing. If, I don't think any of that lightly. I don't think any of it lightly. I still, I'm, I'm going to go back to the logic that caused us to hit pause to begin with. And if that logic has not fundamentally changed, which is we hit a pause button and progressing into the next phase because we were seeing an escalation in both average daily incidence rate and testing positivity rate, then to me the logic would dictate that until we saw that trend going back down in another direction, so it's not just Why would we advocate for progression? Mm -hmm. So our logic was here, and unless something has fundamentally changed with that logic model, which I don't know that it has, why, why is it different now? Why are we arguing for progression in the midst of increasing rates when a few weeks ago that didn't seem like a good idea? Amy, I, I agree. I just, can I ask, um, you know, you, you know, just in terms of phase three, what, you know, is it just two weeks of decreasing numbers or is it, or do we need to see it get down to a certain, level? I guess that, that would be my only question about that because I mean, maybe we get, maybe we see a decrease, but it hovers at a level that is where we hit the pause button before. Like what, I know that that's maybe getting into the weeds a little bit, but there's been a lot of work on phase three and I know there's a lot of families out there that are interested in it. And I just wonder like, what, what is going to be that threshold? Or have we, you know, are we there yet? So I think, I mean, one way of looking at that is if you, um, one, we, we really want that average daily incidence rate. Um, even if, if, we definitely want that average daily incidence rate to decrease. We'd certainly like it out of the red. The place that Harvard refers to is, is widespread community transmission. Um, and, we want to see it decreasing, I would say, at least for a couple of weeks. Um, again, what caused us to hit pause, what well, we were seeing this increase. And we said, whoa, that's, that's not a signal to move forward. Um, yeah, and if that not, so there's not a number within that range below the red, which feels more acceptable than red, certainly. There's not a number that I pinpointed within that, but I would recommend that uh, 
we're, we're using that same logic that we want to see things going downward. Um, hey, Annie. Mm -hmm. I think um, Heather may have been removed. I just accepted her again. Can you make her co-host and just make sure she has speaking privileges? Yeah, I'm, I'm back on now, okay. but okay. you have to make me co-host or you have to tell me to unmute That's every funny. time. <laughs> Annie, you can do that. But I can be quiet the rest of this meeting, no problem. <laughs> no, no, no. We need you back. There we go. All right. Sorry, uh, internet went out. Must have traveled from Annie's house over to mine. <laughs> So is it something that we have to make a decision right now? Because I'm not sure that we reasonably can make a decision with when we move into the next phase right now until we continue to monitor the data for the next few weeks. I just don't Yeah, think we no. need to have a discussion in a few weeks about it. When is it reasonable to move once we start to see how the next few weeks go? Yeah, that's not, I was not suggesting that. I was actually suggesting that, um, Thank you for asking that clarification. I'm suggesting that the school committee, um, what th the things on which you are clear now. So if one of those, there's been some conversation about uh, that first week that make a motion, make that decision, make it clear and communicate it. Continue to discuss that more if you'd like, but what you know you're going to do, let's do that now so people know that that's helpful, whatever little bit of certainty that we can provide. Um, and then those things that you would still like to deliberate further, um, let's identify what those are and when you wanna revisit those things. And phase three, even this evening when Ms. Camuso presents phase three, she very clearly is looking for approval on that plan because it deviates from what was originally presented back in August as part of the reopening plan, but not selecting a time to move into that phase. That's not what we're looking for this evening. Just the, um, the phase itself, how it's organized and structured, structured approval for that. But we're not, that's coming up next. This right, right. now is just about so the instructional we're, model. If we're, if we're looking for a motion, I think this is the one that we're talking about. Uh, motion to stay remote through the first week of the new year at which point we re-examine the numbers and see where those numbers stand with re respect to our metrics. And Annie, will we be having a meeting at that time? I think there was a conversation you and I had that said that that Thursday we'd be having a, a meeting looking at the numbers that come out that Thursday, or perhaps it was that Friday. Friday, you'd have to do it Friday. One okay. eight, meeting that out Friday to examine the numbers and ensure whether or not we would resume at um, phase two. Is that the motion you're looking for? Right, I thought, I thought the, the whole point was, Annie, we were giving you the discretion to make that and setting parameters around you making that so that you didn't need to come to us every time. Wasn't that the pitch? Is that it? So that was an option that I presented, but I'd be perfectly happy with making a motion about the first week. And then if you want to, uh, unless you're very clear tonight, again, you want to revisit both these things after you met, it's done for one week at a time, but then know what we're saying as parents, be prepared for this on and off switch. If you're still uncomfortable with that and you wanna give that more consideration, I would suggest making the motion about the first week and picking the need, uh, uh, deciding when we're going to make a determination about uh, how long intervals would be for changing the instructional model. I know you guys will give me the authority and I appreciate it, but I'm just not saying on this trip alone. I'll tell you right now, no matter what. To be honest, I don't have a problem with making the motion for something as first week remote and on that Thursday, the 7th, I think is what it is. Um, Annie makes that call based on our current metrics. And if it's something that we make a time to, I mean, this is the holidays, we're all going to be busy. You know, we can find another time to discuss whether and review, I, I would like to say review our metrics to ensure that they are still the most appropriate metrics to use. That doesn't mean the metrics are going to change. It just means that we're going to provide a review since we haven't done that since, I don't even remember, August. Um, I personally feel comfortable um, giving her that authority to provide um, weekly decisions based on our current metrics about whether within phase two um, about whether or not children need to be remote or in person with the first week remote in phase two, not discussing changing phases. I 
I suppose I, that I, I think maybe at the next meeting we talk about what when we would transition to phase phase three. I agree, Paul. I and I agree. We we shouldn't try to arbitrarily pick that date now, but I do think we should have a future discussion around that, especially in light of tonight. You know, hearing from April what phase three um, proposals will look like. So you're you're considering a motion. I think this will make it clear to the community and any staff who are, who are watching. You're considering a motion that the week of January fourth, students would continue to. Uh, be remote for that first week after break on if the data released on Thursday, January 7th, if the average daily incidence rate and testing positivity rates were uh, exceeded the threshold established by the school committee, then remote learning would continue for the following week. That's the motion. Is there a movement? A second? So moved. <laughs> Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Okay. Thank you, everyone. I know All right, that, thank that you. was hard. Someday it won't be this hard. Someday it won't be this hard. Next when year will it won't that be. This be? Hard. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a quick question before you guys mm -hmm. move on to my presentation? Uh, and it's okay if you're not talking about this now, but I just want to clarify. Were you also going to make a recommendation about athletics or are you going to do that the first week of January? Because they're supposed to start January 11th. I don't I think, think I'd... there was a in front of us. I don't think there was one. There, yeah, it was listed as one of the possibilities on this document. I kind of feel like we should wait and also have um, uh, the athletic director, Mr. Sudnick, on. Okay. I think that's great. Right. I'll say as long as the MIAA still is allowing it, I don't see a reason why we would change our decision. I mean, there's been a lot of towns right. in the uh, schools in the valley that have authorized athletics and I mean right now given the phase we are in the state they can't compete it's only practice so unless the state unless the governor changes the phase it's my understanding we can't do any competition so Paul I guess along those lines and the way that it was uh, drafted in this data review um, outline Annie is it that if only if we are in the red that we really need to have this discussion with not only um, Eric Sudnick, but also Board of Health, Emma, uh, in terms of uh, having the school committee determine if students will participate in athletic activities. But if we're not in the red, then we're a-okay? If students are learning remotely, um, does the school committee wish to allow students to proceed with their extracurricular athletic program? as they would if they were in person or students are learning remotely does the school committee wish to um, say that when students are learning remotely particularly for this reason of high rates of community transmission do we suspend athletic activities during that time yeah i'm not comfortable making a motion on that tonight okay either yeah. way i think it makes sense that we pick that up when we resume okay I think also, Annie, we should be clear that when this is on the agenda, um, that we spell that out, that that item, including, yep. you know, discussion around athletics uh, involvement sure. is on there. Perfect. Okay. All right. I think that's, I think that's it with that. Okay. So the next item then we reviewed the health data. We talked about instructional model, and now it is phase three presentation, I believe. Yes? April, the floor is yours. All right, let me screen share. Thanks, Emma. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, let me need to present. All right, everyone can see my screen. Yes. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. 
So I know you guys got to look at this ahead of time, um, but I know not everyone in the public did. So I will try to keep this as simple as possible for everyone. It is a little bit complicated if you look at all of the attached links to this. Um, but I wanted to start by telling people the things that we considered in designing this. We had a, a, some different surveys and other methods of feedback that we gathered for this. So from staff, we heard that to them, the physical space between students was really important and a desire not to lose that six feet. We asked them about uh, moving through full days versus moving through adding blocks at a time, and they preferred that block approach. They also overwhelmingly did not want to add lunch into the equation as well. So wanting to focus just on adding one new piece to everything. They wanted to minimize mixing as much as possible. They also said that they were comfortable with four to six weeks for phases. That question you'll see doesn't necessarily line up to the plan, but that has to do with the approach that we took. Uh, and that approach just sort of ended up creating the period of time. And then there's also a concern about the workload and what that is going to look like when students are in two places. And that's a concern that is still really continuing. And I know on the family end, it's a concern for slightly different reasons, but it's the same type of concern. So families have really emphasized that they want that face-to-face -face instruction. Uh, there's a preference that they only want their students to come in when they're receiving that face-to-face -face instruction. And again, they're concerned about the quality of remote learning when students are face-to-face. -face. And from students, and uh, Paul mentioned this, I'll share more about the student and staff surveys, hopefully in January. I don't have all of that for everyone today. We, we did start to share that with departments though by grade level, but some of the bigger pieces from that survey from students when I asked them about what they wanted to see in phase three, they referenced a strong desire for social interaction and their friends. Those were things they really missed. Um, I'll say side note, they also really miss PE and sports as well. So again, I think not being in front of a screen and being able to be with other kids is important. They're looking for that face-to-face -face instruction less screen time, and then some of them noted wanting to be able to move safely in the halls, right? So I think visualizing something where they don't wanna see packed hallways and, and kids all around them, which is reasonable. So as a result, there are these two links. I'm not gonna click on these here, but these take you to the supporting documents that we've created to help make sure that this plan will work. So in thinking about our new plan, uh, again, we looked at maintaining that six feet of space the only way to maintain the six feet of space and have students in their actual classes was to move the classes to bigger rooms and use overflow rooms. But again, the only way to do that was to move the school in two chunks. So we're moving the school by seven and eight by middle school and by nine through 12, one at a time. So in those two separate chunks and then still looking at a noon dismissal. Again, by moving them in that way, you have students, if middle school moves first, moving through some of their classes face to face, and that entire time, nine through 12, stays in their cohort. Because we know that not all students wanna be present for that cohort model, we wanna give them the option to stay home during that off week. However, our plan has accounted for every single student. So we can still remain a fully in-person school and we've created spaces for all of those other students to stay with cohort teachers while other students move. Um, and again, in order to get that face-to-face -face time, we looked at adding a block approach. Uh, I hope there, a lot of people referenced, you know, if we move all classes just on Monday, can I just stay home the rest of the week? And we, we really wanna see the kids there all week. So instead we add blocks over time. So that gets students in Monday through Friday because they're getting that face-to-face -face time throughout the week. But it also reduces the number of classes and then that potential mixing and transmission by doing that. So again, they're getting that face-to-face -face time, but they're moving less. This is an example of what one of those blocks might look like. And we have a couple of different representations of this. I'm going to thank uh, Miriam Gladstone for creating all of these maps. They were very complicated and they helped us to identify any errors that we had and identify extra spaces that we might not have originally thought about. 
This just shows you uh, in the key here, which classes are in session moving, which classes are cohorted, and then where some extra spaces are as well. And so we have these maps for every single block and for both um, seven through eight and nine through 12. We also have this in uh, a slightly less interesting um, just spreadsheet that tells you where every room is uh, for every teacher in every block. So we have it in two different ways. This is just an example of the cohorts. So we have identified for each teacher the grade level, the room, and the number of students that would be in that cohort room along with the room capacity. So we did that for all of the students, again, assuming 100% of students return. And because we're looking at this block approach over time and we're alternating which blocks, and we're also looking at alternating the, the kids their week on and week off, it ends up being about a 10 week phase. Um, now, of course, again, maybe if we're looking at a slightly different timing, we might also look at that, but currently it's kind of projected at a 10 week phase as students are still dismissed at noon. So this block approach that I mentioned, there's actually two different options that we were looking at. There could be a million, of course, we did this lots of different ways. Um, in one of these options, it is the one we call slightly more aggressive, although neither is aggressive, where students start by mixing with three classes. So you can see A, B, and F, G. And you can see here that grades, oh, sorry, I should update this. I'll change that later. At, at one point, we were looking at grades seven through nine and 10 through 12, and we changed it to seven to eight, nine through 12. So I'll fix that for everyone afterwards. But anywhere you see that, it's seven to eight and nine through 12. So in that first week, middle school moves, and then the next week, high school moves, and it just continues on. So you can see that articulated there. Um, and then the way it looks is here. So we've highlighted the blocks that are moving and the way that they move throughout the week. And again, because our, our days shift, those will kind of change as to where you hit those blocks. Those are a couple examples. And then the second one is slightly less aggressive where it's two blocks. And so then again, you see that here. And so we're hoping that students come. Of course, you still have some of those days off. We would want students to be there the whole time as the blocks continue and you add more blocks and change out the blocks you get kind of that spreading over time. So here's a week where you get a little bit more spread throughout and it kind of depends on the week. If we did that, we kind of talked about a potential phase four and none of this, none of the phase four or five talks have been discussed uh, with the staff as a whole yet. This was just kind of projecting as the team working on this together, how that might look. So we might still do that block approach, but have everybody move, right? That might be a, a next logical step. And phase five perhaps could be everyone moving through all classes and we're not sure about a half day. So we're not talking about any approvals of phase four or five at this point, but we're just thinking about rethinking this whole next step, what that might look like and what uh, a next sort of logical build on might be from the phase three suggestion that we're making. We also wanted to go through what that would look like for students. I know there's a lot of questions uh, from everyone about what that might actually look like realistically. So I tried to take us through that. And so if you came into school, you would arrive to school between 7.20 to 7.35. If you are a freshman, this is a freshman schedule. You might go to your cohort teacher, Ms. Roberts. In that particular kid's schedule, their D and E block, AP US History and Biology that day would be remote. They'd have a mask break. So they're in their cohort taking their class, go on mask break. And then they would go to their FG, which is world literature in those two rooms, 115 and 110. They're next to each other with a door. Have another mask break and then go to A block, personal finance in 116, 110. Those are across the hall from each other. They get dismissed at noon and then they have that 1230 to two time, just like they usually do. And if you're a remote student following that same schedule, right, you arrive to school between 735 and 740. You attend D and E block remotely, have your mask break, attend world literature, attend personal finance, dismiss. So you're following the same schedule. In terms of instruction, I know that's where people have a lot of questions. Uh, again, that's gonna continue to vary by grade, subject, the specific lesson, the teacher. Departments are collaborating around what that will look like and really trying to think about for particular subjects and grades, how that might look. And they're continuing to seek feedback from students and trying new methods. Some classes during that time will continue to be remote and look exactly as they do now, right? Especially during that off week or depending which blocks are face to face. So it's just a sort of incremental addition. 
So thinking about that, I wanted to give an example. So this is an example of a student who's in a world literature class and a student who's remote. And this is a slightly more synchronous approach that a teacher could try. So the in-person student could arrive in room 115, 110, sanitize their hands and sit, spray their desks down. Um, the teacher will take attendance, then the students will take a reading quiz, the teacher reviews the chapters with them, and then they work in a small group to create a character bulletin, um, it's like a little characterization activity, and then they share that out at the end. If you're the remote student, you still log in to take Zoom attendance with your teacher, you still take your reading quiz, you might watch a video instead reviewing the chapters, you would open up your Google Meet and work with an in-person student to create that character bulletin, and then you could complete a ticket to leave to share your final takeaways. So that's one example. A slightly more asynchronous approach could be that an in-person student comes into another class, comes in, takes attendance, the teacher completes a lecture using Pear Deck on the elements of drama, and then the class reads Act 1 together and discusses it. If you're a remote student, log in, take attendance, stay on Zoom in case you need help, watch that Pear Deck presentation, same one on the elements of drama, read Act 1 in the play, maybe alone, maybe with a remote partner or group, um, and then submit your feedback for that afterwards. In terms of week one of phase three, we do really want to begin with two days of the cohort model. Um, as you guys know, we don't have many students in the building, and we really want to be able to have everyone in the building and review the protocols, you know, which staircase to go up, when and where to wash your hands, uh, going out on mask breaks before we start mixing students as well. And because we haven't had as many students back, we're hoping we're gonna have more back and we wanna be able to just go through those protocols more safely. Um, the other thing we do need to still decide is how many blocks we add to start and over uh, what time. So that is something that still needs to be decided. We did survey the staff um, around that and they were leaning towards the more conservative approach. I also surveyed the staff um, in conjunction with the union to find out about the support for this particular phase. We had 28 respondents. Of those 28, um, 19 were in support, so almost 70% were in support of the phase three plan. The nine who said they were not, we did ask them why. Six of them just cited concerns about moving out of phase two, especially considering the current situation. We know it's really hard to talk about phase three right now because people are thinking about the current metrics in phase two. Um, and so we still saw some of that concern. So those responses weren't necessarily about phase three in design, but just the idea of moving into phase three. Um, a couple of people had questions about whether we should be mixing students at all. Um, also concerned about sharing a classroom because this plan does involve moving classrooms and how that's going to be cleaned, which is in our earlier plans from this summer. And then one person had a concern about how to do labs, both in person and remotely, um, and doubling those up. So again, that wasn't necessarily about the exact phase three model. That's any model where you have students in person and remote. So our next steps from here, uh, we were supposed to do a staff step up day, um, but that did not end up happening this day due to our current situation. So we'll try that just to make sure that our schedules of where everybody is supposed to be actually work. We'll pretty quickly find out if there's an issue, if uh, people are moving into each other. And then we'll decide which block approach to take. We will continue to work with departments around instructional plans. I know that's really important to students, to families, and to staff as well. I'll be reviewing the mask break zones and dismissal plan to make sure that those line up with the increased numbers. We'll prepare our physical spaces, which primarily involves adding desks and potentially moving some furniture. Mr. Mish and I have been working on that. We need to survey families to find out who's planning on returning, work with transportation around bus transportation, assign students to those final cohorts, reassigned rooms as needed based on how many students are returning because again this plan is at full capacity but if we don't have 100 percent returning we might change some of those spaces and then update school brain so that students see the room numbers in their schedule so that they can easily follow the schedule and go to the appropriate rooms so those are our next sort of steps uh, once we are set with the plan um, so i am looking tonight for uh, of course, any questions and approval of the plan. Um, and if there are any significant concerns that involve any type of revision to, to look for that so that we can continue the process of finalizing this to move forward. Again, before I take questions, I would just say our goal is to try to 
maintain all of our mitigation strategies, really try to maintain that space, keep all students in school, and give them increased face-to-face -face time throughout the week. We don't want kids just coming back on Monday and being gone the rest of the week. So that's the, the kind of theory behind that block approach that will get them a little bit every day, but not increase the mixing through all of the classes. We also wanted to try to bring in some of those electives early because we know that kids are missing that hands-on time um, and some of what they're doing in those electives. So we wanted to give them those opportunities. So I will take any and all questions. Uh, and if I can't answer any of them, I will note them to get you answers for later, but hopefully I can. April, I'll just kick it off with a thank you. Um, this. Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate the detail, the use of real examples. Um, it helps to envision, you know, what this would look like in practice. Um, I don't have any questions, but one thing I just wanted to also thank you for is the consideration on the slide where you indicated that um, the families would have, a, students would have an option to stay home on those weeks off. I, I really, I like that. I think that it's, it is nice to give the kids that choice should they feel like um, they would prefer to attend that remote week from home. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? My, um, thank you too for putting this together. I read through it before and I was, quite frankly, very confused by some of the charts and the tables. And so I don't envy you and I appreciate you and your time and your effort because I know this, this absolutely cannot be an easy task for you or anybody really. Um, my, my only concern um, <coughs> as we go through this um, is something that I know I had brought up before and I think at least one other school committee member had brought it up was you know, our numbers right now, how many kids we have back at Hopkins right now versus the potential of where we could be. Even imagine if everybody came back for phase three and we were at full capacity, that is a huge increase in the number of students. So having everybody stay put for two days and two days only is concerning to me. Um, I, I do feel like kids should stay put in the building for at, at least a week. So that way we can monitor. I just think coming back for two days, um, depending on your numbers, you know, your sheer volume of students that you might have coming back because they're excited and, you know, motivated and I get it um, to come back and be able to move. I just worry about that really being um, more than one change at a time. And I would just, I would make the suggestion that they have, they have at least that full week of coming back um, and, not moving, um, getting used to the setting because it's different for kids who have been remote and then just ensuring that we're still, again, that's kind of like a mitigation strategy, right? To keep them in place for that week, make sure we're okay, make sure we don't have any students getting sick, transmission, whatever, and then considering, again, at least a week to not, um, just to ensure that we're being as safe as we can be. That's my only thought. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think this the staff certainly agree with you as well around that. I, I guess what I would say, and maybe, you know, I can do some thinking around how to accomplish this, uh, to, to Paul's point, um, you know, I, I don't want to delay phase three forever, um, but maybe there's a way to get people to come in at the end of phase two, because that is phase two right now. They're just choosing to stay home. One of the reasons we opted for two days was because we're afraid if we tell them you have to come in for a week in the cohort model that they're just not going to do it because that's what's currently happening. Um, so it's kind of this this tough part, but maybe if they know, you know, this is phase three and this is when it's starting, but could you please come in this last week of phase two? You know, that's what phase two is designed for, for exactly what you said, to say with everyone in the building, in these higher numbers, how is it going before we then mix everyone around? Um, so maybe, you know, I'll, I'll talk with the staff and maybe there's a way to get some of that information and to get some kids to come back in in that phase two cohort model before we move. That way we don't have to add that time into phase three. So I, I appreciate that because that is one of our concerns. Right. And I don't think it, it matters to me when you look at phase two versus phase three, but it's the point, my point behind it is that 
let's get the kids back in the building. Okay, now they're all back in the building. Is it going okay? Okay, now let's introduce movement. So I do think that if you're going to have kids come back for, again, phase three, I don't, I think it's most helpful not to have some kids come back in phase two, but then half of that, say if you've got 100 kids coming back for phase three, if 50 of them come back in phase two for a week and then 50 more come back, you're still introducing a lot more kids and having movement. So if you can get everybody back in the building that's planning on it, whether it be a week or two before the phase starts, that's that, you know, that's not necessarily important to me as long as it's you get everybody back in the mood in the building that isn't planning on being back and then start the movement. I could see it being a requirement. I could I see do. you part of phase three uh, being in person a requirement is you have to have been in phase two in the building for at least a week, hmm. not two. Yeah, one of the other things we've talked about too is trying to incentivize kids by trying to think about some fun things that we could do. <laughs> so if it's a requirement and if we could build in some, you know, safe distance bonding time um, to get them into the building, that that might help as well. So we're having some of those conversations because we know it's not, you know, they want it to be like it was last year when they're there and it's just not. And that's really, really tough. Um, but I like those ideas. So I appreciate that and I can I can take those back to the team. And a reminder that maybe it's it's such a short amount of time for however long we've already been in this pandemic. So, you know, I know it's not exciting, but a week <laughs> of time versus 10 months in a pandemic, it's just not a lot of time to have to start that way to make sure we're being safe. Make it a summer week. And, and, and to continue on that, is there, has there been any thought as to kind of what will be the expectation for families to opt back in kind of after that initial opt-in? You know, I'm just thinking you, at, at the end of your presentation, you talked about like uh, revisiting the numbers and, you know, adjusting as needed. Um, are, after you kind of do the initial phase three reopening, is there going to be a, is there any, any thought to kind of the time period that you're going to need? Um, before people rejoin just because of the way you're going to be potentially shuffling around classes and moving things? Yeah, we haven't. Um, I mean, so far we haven't needed a lot of time to do that. But what we did do in this phase, which I would like to do in the next one, is we didn't restructure everything immediately. We did wait a little bit to see what would happen with the numbers. So I think similarly, you know, we would still try to plan for that max and have a sort of uh, backup I like to have a million plans. So, you know, if we still have that maximum plan and then say, well, if we end up with this many less, let's just reallocate. And this means this would be here instead. We have those plans that allows us to adjust. Uh, I mean, we want all kids in school. So we try to make it work in terms of kids coming back in and finding those appropriate spaces. So again, you know, we have a plan where we can fit every single one there all of the time. Um, and then I think we would give some time but I think you're right, it, it might help because it's a little bit more complicated phase to be clear about that. But certainly, you know, we don't want to keep kids out of school who want to be in school. Um, so, you know, we don't want a, a long window on that. Just to play devil's advocate too, because um, that's a good point, Ethan. Um, I, would, I would throw caution because we don't, want to be five weeks into phase three where you've only got a 25% increase in the number of students that want to come back at the beginning of the phase. And then all of a sudden you're moving three separate blocks and now a large chunk of kids want to come back again. That kind of defeats the purpose of the concern now of making sure that we get the kids back in the building. I know that some of that is really hard for you to kind of control and mitigate, but again, emphasizing that halfway through a phase, having a large portion of kids come back would be, again, a, a concern. Yeah, I do hear that. I guess I would have to check in with you, Annie, and the powers that be about our, our legal requirements around that, because um, I think that's where things get a little complicated. Uh, there isn't a tentative time period. It's uh, reasonable. A word that's not legally defined, but yeah, we could <laughs> certainly, uh, we could communicate with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and see 
what limits we need to adhere to. I guess I would say the, the, the one of the nice things about this plan is that it does kind of give you a two week window, right? If, if, if students return one week and then they go remote for that second week and after that first week, kids are, are more interested in coming back. Maybe they talk to their friends or they, they realize that they want to be back in, in, in instruction. There's at least one week mm -hmm. of, of preparation. That's not a lot of time, but there's a little bit of time there. Yeah, that's true. So I believe what we're hoping for this evening is approval of that plan, not when it would be implemented, but approval of that plan. Or the questions, are your questions an indication that you want to hold off on that, or is the school committee comfortable considering approving it? I'm comfortable. I think I really appreciate all the thought that's gone into this. So thank you. Yeah, me too. me too. It sounds like what we're going to get some more clarity on, right, is that shift from phase two to phase three and the building up of numbers in person over mm -hmm. over time and what that looks like. Like Tara, to your point, that last week of phase two may be the, that week of fun activities where everybody's in the building because that is the transition phase into phase three. And I would be okay with the approval of the plan with the caveat that there, need to, there needs to be a clear transition of kids coming into the schools separate from starting the move. Just otherwise I, I think it's okay. And so there is one of those clear transitions in there now, but it's two days, right? Correct. And I don't, I, I think it needs to be at least a week. I don't think two days is enough because having kids in the building for two days and then having them move is just a big change over 48 hours. So again, if that's something that you look into revising the end of phase two, whenever that may end to giving kids the pre-up, whatever you do with, you know, if you send out surveys saying, here's, here's the plan. If you're planning on starting phase three, we need you back on X date to finish out phase two, whatever it may be. But I, I just think there needs to be at least that week of getting kids back in the building. So can we, um, can a motion to approve uh, phase three as presented with one week of transition instead of two days. Um, can, can that be a motion? And then you can figure out whether that one week comes out of the end of phase two or not, but at least you have a clear plan to move forward with. Mm -hmm. Are folks okay with that? Yeah, I'm sorry, Tara. So the, the one week gives you time to do what as opposed to two days? Ensure that you're having a safe transition. I'm just making sure there's a safe transition. Within 48 hours, you're just not going to ensure that it's safe having all those kids back in school. Having them back a week in school just to make sure that it all moves smoothly from a safety perspective. But I'm sorry, the, the concern is the actual organization of moving the kids? Because if so, then phase two doesn't inform that. So it's because we've got just a small amount of kids at Hopkins right now. And the introduction of phase three, the anticipation would be that we're going to have a lot more kids interested in it so we're going to have a huge influx of kids coming in and we're going to start them moving and the only time they stay stagnant is just for 48 hours so if we keep them stagnant and again it can be the end of phase two that doesn't necessarily make a, a difference from my perspective keeping them in one place for a week to ensure that we don't have any for instance school transmissions making sure that we're keeping proper and safe mitigation strategies in place. I just think we need more than, than 48 hours. I, I get the intent. I just don't see how the logistics work. Just having them sit together in a room, you sort of, you're not going to figure out the logistics because the logistics comes when phase three starts. So you're going to figure out whether but you're having kids in a building where their kids weren't in a building. So you're having a lot more mingling of students, even if it's not, again, mixing and moving. You're having a lot of students that were at home coming together. So let's just make sure that when they come together that first week, we're not introducing any safety concerns. And then after that first week, we can say, okay, we've got a whole big chunk of kids coming back into the school. We seem to be doing okay. It's been a week. We're not hearing any concerns. Nobody's out sick, whatever it may be. Okay, now let's start our move. And the move is, su is sequential and you know incremental that I don't think it's a problem. But again, I just think 48 hours back, 
I, I would just hate to see something with the numbers we are right now, wherever we are, for there to just be a problem just because we only gave it the 48 hours. I think that we talked about just in introducing one, um, one change at a time. And it just seems like two big changes right there, having a large portion of kids come back at school and start them mixing when we've been cohorted for so long without any mixing at all. And most of the kids are both. So I'm just suggesting having, you know, that one week where we have a whole bunch of kids back at school before we start having them move their first block or whatever block it is that you're going to start with that moving. That's all. So, I mean, I'm fine with whether it's two days or a week, I'll go with the administration's recommendation on this because it, that first week of movement, as I understand from this plan, is still only grades seven through seven, eight, right? That first week of movement, it's not everybody moving. Yeah, and so that, that also means that potentially if you're t uh, nine through 12 and choosing your week off, that you wouldn't necessarily start that week some students will, they come all the time. Um, but if we look at our current numbers, most of those students will probably stay home for that first week and then show up the following week. I would anticipate we might retain more middle schoolers in the week where nine through 12 is moving, uh, but probably not much in the reverse. Right. But I mean, with the high school, you could do it just- Tara, I understand the intent of that week. I think what we're hearing though is I don't know that we can guarantee that everybody that's going to be part of phase three would come for that week. And then they'd be potentially if they're nine through 12 going home for the next week as it is, and then coming back into the building the following week. So I, I think what this does is it may actually offset how many people are physically in that building week by week, because you're allowing for the kids to learn remotely when they aren't in a movement week. I don't understand how the two day period would apply to the week of middle schoolers, but not to the week of high schoolers. What about all those kids who haven't stepped foot in the high school? You, April, are you saying you, they don't need to have that kind of training? No, I mean, again, in theory, the plan is for everyone to return. Um, and so in theory, everyone would be going through those two days, but again, they have the option to not. Um, so to your question, that might be a little bit of a, a flaw because we do want to make sure that everybody reviews their protocols at the start. Um, it's making me wonder if, if something more like, you know, taking a couple days out of phase two, almost a more clear like orientation days might make more sense. You know, this is when middle school comes in for their orientation day, and this is when high school comes in for their orientation time, and they go through those protocols. Because uh, you're right, they might not come in that next week if they have that option to be off. And then when they do come in, they'll just come in and start moving. And so that is, as you're pointing out, a potential flaw in that, in that projected theory. April, is there any way, this is probably way too much, is there any way to have the high schoolers come in during that first week of instruction for seventh and eighth and do that kind of remote cohorted learning, learn protocols. In theory, yeah, I mean, we can certainly- and It would increase the numbers obviously in the building a ton, but it would, I mean, I, I feel like for me, I, I'm just thinking about like er, people getting used to the, the new numbers, the increased numbers. Um, it'll also give you kind of the sense, a better sense of whatever issues may arise in that first week if you have as many kids as probably will be possible in the building. But I don't know if that's doable. Yeah, I mean, we could certainly ask them to. I mean, I will say again that some of the staff wanted a week. So I'll say that to, you know, the idea of even just being used to having that many more people in the building is, you know, each stage is kind of a, a big deal. I think, again, our concern was how are we going to get kids to come in for a week because they haven't come in <laughs> for phase two. Uh, so I think if that's what we're looking at, then, you know, I just have to get together with Sir Simmons and, and find some fun stuff for them to do and, and tell people they're going to have to take some blocks off for some fun activities because 
you know, that's how we're going to get them in for a week. And that's okay. You know, it's right around the time where we had midterms. So instead we'll just do fun activities instead of tests, but um, you know, we can do what we have to do. I, I'm not sure if I can have all of those specific answers for you guys tonight. So I, I think to, to Annie's question, if it's important that we have those details ironed out before you approve it, that's fine. And I can take it back to the staff and we can iron out some of those problems. I'd like to talk to, to that, that team again that I worked with and the staff before making that decision about exactly how those days will look like, because that's how we've done this whole process. I would be oh, okay very with happy with seeing a revised plan uh, that addresses that on-ramping strategy and also really exploring this notion of will they come back and rather making it a requirement mm -hmm. of if you want to be a part of the in-person activity, then you will do this. Um, and determining whether it comes out of the last week of phase two or the first week of phase three. And I'd be happy to review that at the next school committee meeting. So I guess I have a little different perspective. I, I trust you all to make a wise opinion. I think you've outlined this well. I, you've heard our concerns. I trust you all to go back and um, make a decision. I, I know the seniors I know are not gonna go sit for a week. There's a reason why they're not there. And that's the reason. So I think you're right on, on target there, April. So um, I'm happy to support a motion tonight and you can inform us what you've decided, decided later. So I'm, I'm actually, I, I agree with you, Mayor, on this. I still stand um, where, I, where I do before. I know kids want to get back in the building and I, I hope that people understand that the school committee, even as much as we don't always agree on everything and it seems frustrating, I personally do want kids back in the building too, but I just don't, I, I want to assure that we're keeping it as safe as we possibly can. And I'm just, I'm still personally, again, not comfortable um, not having a safe transition plan into the phase. And again, it doesn't have to be the first week of phase three. It can be the last week of phase two. And again, it's really about getting kids back in the building and ensure that we're safe for more than just two days um, and mixing what would We lose Tara now. No. I think she froze, so maybe we could. It, it's her turn to, to, to freeze up. <laughs> it's the internet bug. I, I, I just, I mean, while while she's unfreezing, I, I would just add that to, Paul, there's, you're absolutely right. There, there's a reason why the kids aren't in the building. I think in, we're asking them to come into the building, and yes, it's in a cohorted model for one week, but we're, we want them back in the building, and this gives them the opportunity to get back into the building as soon as possible and there is going to be a few days where they are uh, not going to be moving but it also in this plan gives them the flexibility to stay home when they're not um, in person or moving classes so I think there's there's a little give and take there and I feel like we've already kind of reassessed phase three and, and asking for a little bit it doesn't seem to be too much I just don't see a magic between two days and a week. And I trust the administration to make that decision. So I don't need to be involved in those in that level. And um, I certainly don't want to require somebody to come sit for a week before they can enjoy the benefits of in person. So that seems inappropriate to me. So if you want to, if I'm, you know, let's just. It seems like we've got a decision, or, or somebody make a recommendation. Let's let's move forward. And, April bottom line is the, the little bit of transition, you know, we can figure out, but I think you've all outlined a good strategy. So thank you. Yeah, and April, appreciate the attention to incorporating the survey feedback um, from, you know, students and from the, the staff there and families. And so are we, maybe you know this April, is are we bringing back a plan for approval or is the school committee what I what I heard the expectation of integrating the feedback. Is there? I was hearing, and let me just get Tara sure. back in here. We'll just her back. She, she needs to be, needs to be yeah, co-host. And yeah. Hey, Tara. I think what we were settling on. Uh, you. Uh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Now we can hear you. Sorry. I think where we where we landed was um, to have a motion to approve the the phase three 
plan with the caveat that there would still be work that we would discuss at a future meeting around what that transition from phase two to phase three looks like. Uh, we didn't, I don't think we settled on it must be a week, it must be required, it, it can only be two days. but that we'll bring it back to this group to discuss that transition, what it looks like. Is that So fair? we're not deciding the transition piece, but we're approving the remainder of the plan. I think we all agree that there needs to be some transition here. I think there's a, you know, picking two days over five days, whether people will come, whether we can require them to come. I think that's, that's something that I don't know that we know enough on that to decide that tonight one way or another. So I, I think I'd prefer that we discuss that piece the next time, April, you, you know, you have a chance to talk with your team. You had uh, feedback from staff that preferred a little bit more of a transition. Let's discuss that part in our next meeting, but that the phase three, as it looks in terms of the, the type of instruction and the movement, I think I didn't hear any concerns about what that looks like. I'd be in favor with uncoupling those two decision points if they were two decision points. So we, we a motion to approve phase three, but table the transition discussion until a later time. I'm, I'm fine with that if folks are uh, comfortable with that motion. Somebody would need to second it. I mean, I'd rather not. I, I trust the administration. I trust you all to make decisions. I don't need to be in the weeds, but whatever we can do to move forward, I'm happy to, if you all, I'm obviously I'm gonna get outvoted here, so let's just, let's move on. Somebody make a motion. I would second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay, so April, thank you to you and your staff for all of the work on outlining phase three, uh, and we'll, talk in the future then about that transition from phase two to phase three and bringing people back into the building. Sure. So just can I ask one thing? So it's okay if I just timeline wise, it's helpful. Thank you for separating those so that I can still move forward and start to tell families this is the, the plan for what phase three will look like to find out if they're interested because that will help <coughs> on a little bit of a timeline. But then we'll save how they re-enter for that later talk when we meet in January. And probably give them a heads up that there will be a re-entry plan. Okay. We'll have to keep in mind. Okay, thank so you. you. When were you thinking about sending out that survey, April? I'd like to tomorrow, but. <laughs> but just, you know, if you, that That's key point, if you're gonna require kids to come in beforehand will be a, a determining factor for some. So if you're gonna put that in, you make it a separate question. Okay. I know certain people might say no to that. And then I think they'll feel it's coercive, so. Okay, yeah. all right, I'll think about that before I send it out. necessarily ask them if they would accept a requirement. That would not be in the survey, right? That's, that doesn't make any sense to do. You're asking them if they would come in for phase three as we've approved it, yeah. correct? Thank you. Okay. Great. All right. Um, we're going to move then uh, on to the Walmart Foundation grant and donation drives. So this should be pretty straightforward. Um, Christian Markowski has generously offered to assist uh, Senora Fitzgibbons and the group of students who are interested in doing a telesquad where they remotely work on building, I believe it's a water filtration system, and I believe this is in Honduras, and that Subsequent to that, this is a field trip that folks approve for the, there will be some students who will follow this project all the way through. So they'll work on uh, establishing clean water from kind of a telesquad engineering project, and then they'll go on a field trip. For the telesquad bit, um, there is a significant amount of fundraising to do this work. Christine Markowski offered to write a, um, or a, submit a, a Walmart Community Foundation grant the first page is on whose behalf are you submitting this? And we would be selecting the school committee. So I just want the school committee's approval that um, Ms. Markowski, employee and a parent of Hopkins children, 
uh, could proceed with um, applying for that grant. That's one request. And the donation drive, the attorneys have indicated that a teacher can't independently solicit and collect funds through things like a donation drive on social media, but a teacher could advertise a donation drive. So what do we mean by donation drive? For some field trips, like doing a service trip or other things, there may be people in the community who say, oh, that's such a great idea. I'm really behind that. I'd love to donate to offset the cost for students involved with that. So an individual teacher, the attorney was clear, does not have the authority to go online and just drive up donations. But they could advertise that this school committee on behalf of said group would accept donations to offset the cost of children participating in this. Should you wish to donate, you would donate um, and we would be earmarked for this activity fund. There's two requests there. One is about the application for the grant. And the second one is um, if the school committee would be open to um, the idea of donation drives. Any questions? Yeah. Can you give a little bit more information about what, what this funding is for? Sure. Do I still, is Senor, are you still here? And I need to look for. Mary, Senor um, presented this to us. A, so a, it's, there she is. Let me ask her to unmute. It's for that international. She's trip. here. Yeah. Oh. Virtual international trip, fundraising for the yeah. trip. Did I unmute you? There you are, Senora. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it, it, this is, yeah, we have a couple things going on, but what we're talking about now is I've been working tirelessly to start a, um, a program where my upper level students and then also a human evolution class can do an, it will be an online curriculum um, that would allow kids to um, mix with people from Colombia, excuse me, from um, Honduras and we switched it up and, um, and, and as Annie said, kind of create a, a clean water system in a rural village that would not normally have one. Um, so I, I started fundraising. I got support of the Board of Trustees, and it's, it is a lot of money. It's almost $200 a, a student, but um, I'm hoping to, to continue to, to raise the money so that um, the, these kids can have this experience during this very troubling time. Great. So it's like it's a virtual, the virtual trip that we approved of. Yes. Great. Thanks. Sounds wonderful, wonderful Ruthann. Thanks for doing that. I agree, and I, I see Christine Markowski is also on here, so I thank you both for the idea. Um, I'm, in, I'm in support of the grant. That's a lot of work to get that legwork done and the paperwork done, um, and to hook it on to you know, the schools. It's just, it's appreciated. And I understand that there's nuances and rules around asking them for um, the donations to support and how that's done. So I think if we're following the, the rules and the letter of the law and we can support it, that it will be, uh, we trust that that will go out in the way that it needs to. Yeah, so would the school committee be comfortable uh, making, it sounds like making a motion to approve an application for the Walmart Community Foundation grant? Yes, so moved. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And secondly, with the school committee, it sounds like be comfortable uh, with um, uh, the idea of a donation drive to support student activities so long as said donation drive has been reviewed by school council. And, and ultimately brought to the school committee, right? To accept the donations, is that? Yes, yes they go to yep. the, the school committee always accepts the donations. Yep, Correct. is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Senor and Christine. Thank you. I don't know, um, Tara, are you able to talk? Somebody's got to make Tara a co host. I not do that. I apologize. I saw your head nodding, so I'm assuming you were in agreement of that. But if you have any questions, please. All right. I didn't nod. I couldn't talk. I was trying to unmute myself, but I'm in agreement with it. So <laughs> that works. <laughs> I just wanted to check. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great. 
Um, our last presentation item then is survey input. So this is the, um, mm -hmm. the survey that we discussed uh, at, I don't know which meeting it was, we've had so many, but a prior meeting. Yeah, so this is just, uh, thank you Paul and Ethan, they got together with me and um, you've already heard parents, the upcoming surveys are parents at Hopkins Academy will be surveyed about that plan. Um, the phase three plan and their intentions. Um, I just wanted, I have put together for the school committee, the surveys that have been administered this year. I did not include any that we did over the summer about asking folks their intentions on remote learning or in-person, those aren't included. But this is just a number of HA surveys, the kinds of surveys, who was surveyed and when they were surveyed. Um, and uh, HES, Similarly, the group that was surveyed for what purpose and when they were surveyed. Um, and uh, the HEA, the group that were surveyed or was more like a focus group or a meeting and for what purpose and when it happened. So if there, it might, if there are specific, I guess that's what I'm looking for, from the committee, if, there, if there's something specific that needs to be asked of a particular group or of the entire district, if, if I could just hear that now, um, that would be extremely helpful. And if there isn't, if these things kind of cover it, because there, there have been a lot, um, and we will still do some more and, and um, that's fine too. Annie, can you scroll to the ones that are future planned survey? No, I don't. I'm sorry. The only future plan, because that's not on there. Not no, because I won't. But no, because I, the only future plan survey right now is uh, asking um, phase three. Phase three. So basically, um, you know, sending out the phase three information and saying, having reviewed this, do you intend to send your Correct. child back in person? Um, and if no, under what conditions would you consider that? So trying to get a little bit more feedback on that level. Yes. So that would be just a Hopkins survey, correct? Yes, because uh, phase three, um, there, there are the adjustments that we made to phase three mean that very little changes at Hadley Elementary School. Right, so the only, when we had met last, my, I guess, concern or suggestion was around um, checking in with both schools again. And I'm just reading the email that got sent out. So um, a short survey. Um, I'm sorry. So about the idea of safety had come up. Yes. So this is something that makes oh, sense. Yeah. What I would propose then if there's concern that we need to hear from staff again about the extent to which safety protocols are being implemented with fidelity, it sounds like there are some concerns that people are voicing concerns that they are not being implemented and those, okay. those concerns are not being surfaced because people aren't being asked. So what I would suggest in that case is that a very there are very specific things that we do, right? Mask wearing, hand washing, physical distancing, um, and uh, cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces, and that we simply ask people to rate themselves, rate the students, uh, rate the building as a whole, uh, the extent to which these things are implemented with fidelity. Um, that would get at, the, if that is in fact the concern, that would get at that. Meaning if the concern is that there are people who uh, believe that these things are not being done with fidelity and that um, that's a widespread concern that is being ignored or not surfaced. I'm happy to ask people across both buildings um, those questions. I would just suggest because it would be interesting to see if people, how they see their own, um, the extent to which they implement these things and versus how they see um, it happening for students and for the building as a whole. Um, I'm interested in it only because I and I think it would be interesting even if there were no concerns brought up just because I, I think it's interesting to get that perspective and to ensure that whatever we're doing as far as you know mitigation and implementation of safety and hand washing and whatever um, 
that we don't need to reinforce something along the way. Like if students don't need to be reminded, do we need to have a half a day of students going or, you know, coming into the school, having a, you know, let's review, this is what we do, you know, or does it need to be done for staff? And I, I think that would be at, at both schools. Okay. Is there anything else that could? Any, I would like to just say that we do, um, and we are planning at the start of any new phase, um, granted phase three doesn't have a lot of changes um, for Hadley Elementary School. We do survey the families that are remote um, to see if they are coming back, when that might possibly happen, although we've been accepting um, remote students throughout phase two. Um, kind of on an as needed basis. I just asked that families call me and we've added several students through throughout phase two. Um, but at the start of phase three, we will be surveying the remote families to see one, are they coming back? Um, and two, um, if they are choosing to stay remote, what, what um, how have their experience has been thus far? Would they need any additional supports to continue to be remote? Um, and any feedback that they would like to share with us. And I, again, I think too in the, you know, I think we've tapped a lot in about the high school in general about kind of where we're at, where things are as far as remote learning, ver remote learning versus in-person learning and, you know, what kids are looking for, what teachers are looking for, what's ideal, what's not ideal, and really just taking a look at, you know, the elementary school and our littlest, you know, Again, this is, I know we talk a lot about the high schoolers, but this is impacting the little ones too. And as much as it is to say that some of them are home, it, just the virus in general is impacting them. Mm -hmm. So just their overall well being. I don't know if it's from the perspective of the parent or if it's from the perspective of the teacher, just overall, how are the kids doing? How are they adjusting? I mean, I know, again, my kid comes home and I get no complaints, no concerns, but he can rattle off freaking statistics about COVID like it's nobody's business. And so that says to me, it's still impacting him. And so just, it might be interesting from, I don't, again, I don't know, a teacher's perspective or a, a parent perspective, how is their student doing in school? Um, and then I, I do like the idea again of, of reviewing this kind of um, safety procedures just to make sure it isn't something that needs to be reviewed, especially with, you know, especially with the little ones, to be honest. Well, I, I could argue that I think there's not probably a, a week or a day that doesn't start off with review of health and safety protocols from our staff. Uh, they've done an amazing job with continuously reviewing with students what what they need to do in the classroom, what they need to do outside at recess. And just like any student, they need reminders, but um, I, I do think that uh, our staff's done a great job reviewing that. And I would anticipate whenever we come back in person from break, uh, whenever that may be, um, we will continue to, to make, the, make sure that we're reviewing that with students. But I do like your point about making sure and checking in with parents about how are their students, how are their children, faring during this global pandemic. I think that's a good point. Perfect, okay, great, thank you. Anything else that people want me to ask? Nothing from me. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, that closes out the presentation items. So I think we can move into the business manager reports. Chris, you've been so patient. I believe you're still on there. Um, we may have to allow you to unmute. So we'll do that. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I have three reports for you tonight. The first one is the expense report for the regular local budget. Um, just uh, you know, looking through, I think there's nine, eight pages in the report. Um, just a few items to point out. Everything really seems to be pretty much in line with um, where we expect to be at this point in time. In fact, if you look at the things like administrator salaries, they're pretty much at 50% um, halfway through the year. So that's uh, certainly nice to see. Um, teacher salaries are a little bit below 50%, but pretty much right there. Um, the one thing about 
those particular salaries is again, because we actually pay through the summer, there are more payments yet to go than you know, uh, just a half a year. We basically have about three quarters of a year to go. But to offset that fact, we have all of the salaries that were supposed to be charged to school choice. So that will come out of that and pretty much bring us right back to normal. Um, going through the report, I, I think on page four, um, the only item on page four that I just wanted to bring to your attention are the health services. Um, where you can see we've spent 1,076% of our local budget. Um, that's really due to the, there's an $18,000 encumbrance in that line for supplies that were ordered. Um, and that's something that would be transferred once they start to come in to one of the grants. Um, so we can certainly move that out of this particular report at that point in time, putting us right back to where we should be. Uh, and the only other item I wanted to point out was toward the end of the report, it's on page six, where we have a number of tuition accounts, um, one to non-public schools, another one to the collaborative program where we have spent more than 100% of the budget. At this point in time, uh, some of that has been moved over to the grants, but we have not moved anything yet to the um, circuit breaker funds. So, and we planned on spending $275,000 in circuit breaker funds. And if you look at the negative balances, we've got about 39,065. So we're looking at about 95,000. So using those circuit breaker funds will bring us back into the positive on there and make our bottom line look, you know, even better than it is. Um, that's pretty much all I had to report on for those particular lines. I didn't know if anyone had any questions on those. None from me. I'm seeing. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, I guess we can just jump over to the revolving accounts report next. Um, there's not a lot of movement in, in some of these accounts just because the programs really haven't been, you know, doing much. Um, look at the athletic one. Outside of the seventeen thousand dollars that we moved from the athletic revolving account because it was kind of holding funds as a placeholder for the athletic field project. That's been pretty flat. Um, the lunch account, you can see, uh, you know, has decreased by quite a bit from June uh, to November, but actually the revenues for that account were not posted yet in, in November. We got an email uh, probably two weeks ago um, with another $32,000 of revenues that we've received. So that brings us right back to the $60,000 range, pretty much to right where we were. So, um, you know, we're certainly looking good in the lunch account. Um, the preschool account is one that has taken a hit um, so far this year. Um, and, you know, if you look at the balance as of November 30th, that, that amount is going to decrease probably to the negative by the end of December and we'll continue to go deeper and deeper into the negative as we go through the year. Um, I actually did run a report today on that particular account. And yeah, so far this year, we've had about $16,650 in revenues and almost $52,000 of expenses. So um, I did email Lauren Winner um, about that just to ask basically what the reason for it was. And she did tell me that, you know, it, it's, it's 100% pandemic related that there's just, you know, way lower numbers of students using the program at this point in time. And they also had less capacity actually to have students because, you know, keeping them all distanced in the classroom meant that you just couldn't fit as many kids in the classroom. So, um, Basically, what we're going to have to do is we're just we're going to you know continue to run the program, and at the end of the year we're going to have to transfer some of those expenses to school choice to bring that account back into the positive. Um, it's looking again if I just look at the numbers I was crunching today, it looks like we'll probably lose this year about ninety four thousand um, dollars. So, you know, just just to bring us back into what we'd consider to be a pretty good position, you know, in, in that revolving account, we'd have to use 
roughly $100,000 of school choice money to bring that back into line. So uh, again, just so you would be aware of that, um, I just wanted to let everyone know. Um, the other accounts, you know, Student Activity and Hadley Kids, not really a lot of activity in either one of those, especially the Hadley Kids, other than a few expenses that had gone through. Um, and I think they were really cell phone expenses uh, for that program. That's been it in the Hadley Kids account. School Choice, I will be doing the transfers this week, actually, of partial um, budgeted amounts to just move some of the expenses to the School Choice account. Um, probably about $400,000 worth, so that'll bring the balance down uh, for the end of December. But the School Choice account is, is really looking very healthy at this point in time. So I didn't know if there were any questions on the revolving account report at all. I do have a, a question. I don't know that this is, um, you know, there's, there's always a danger in dipping into school choice account reserves because it's not, uh, it's not replenishable, it's not sustainable. It is sort of like our, um, you know, we, we can draw upon it for the preschool overages that we imagine. But I have a question about um, Payroll Protection Act funding. And I think I read that some schools were applying to that funding and I know it's for payroll um, and it's 100% grant that's waived. I know that, that the federal government just passed another Payroll Protection Act. And so I just putting out there the question, um, ha have schools, did I just did I hear that incorrectly or have some schools applied for that funding and in would it make sense to do it for this specific instance given that school choice isn't really funding that comes in for preschool related um, you know it isn't offset for students lost on the preschool side of things I wonder whether it makes sense to even ask the question so I would say with um, payroll protection act we can certainly um, explore that further, although I would imagine maybe what you're thinking of, the Collaborative for Educational Services certainly apply for that. Um, and it would make more sense to me if it were things like regional school districts. In this case, it's the town that does payroll. It's not the school department that does payroll. So we could investigate that, but when the collaborative, which you sit on that uh, board for the collaborative, they applied for that because they're, they're their own entity, right? They're an educational service agency that is a separate entity from a town. So we could ask the town, but it's not something that we would do um, without the town. And in terms of that legitimate concern of, hmm, I mean, one, just to remind the public, uh, should we be using school choice for something that is essentially technically an enterprise fund, right? We're supposed to be collecting revenues to cover expenses. Um, it's not truly an enterprise fund in the preschool program. We never have the expectation that we're going to completely recover the revenues. And the staff and services in the preschool program actually benefit the elementary school as a whole. So those, those staff members, their expertise benefits the, the elementary school as a whole. And certainly during COVID, very often some of those folks are subbing, especially the educational support professionals in other places and supporting other students. Um, and the school committee, it's within your rights to utilize school choice pretty much however you see fit. Um, so you wouldn't be running afoul of any school choice. Uh, you wouldn't be violating anything by, by utilizing school choice money to offset the preschool. And the benefits of the preschool do extend to the entire elementary school. I, I've benefited from the program. All three of my kids have benefited from the program. I would never let it run afoul. Um, I was just looking to see whether there were additional resources we should be looking into. Um, so thanks for reminding me that this, the, the um, school, um, all, all of these employees are actually town employees and the town would need to apply. And I'm not sure that towns do apply, but, um, but thank you. Okay, any other questions on that report? Um, all right, if we could just move ahead to the grant report on the next page. Uh, so transfers have been made to these grants. Uh, you can see there's a couple of them here are COVID related. The 102 grant has been fully spent and I drew down all of the funds for that. So we, we have all the funds and we've spent all the funds for that one. There's also the 113 ESSER grant, which 
has not had a lot of expenses yet to it. Um, and those expenses that were spent were basically um, allocated to another school in Hadley that you know we we kind of had to share the grant with another school. So that's what was spent in that particular grant. Um, and the rest is ours to use. We have until June 30th to spend that one. The 102 and a little further down the 118 remote learning tech grant. Um, those, the 118 has also been fully spent and fully drawn down. So we have all the funds for that. These were really tricky grants because the 102 and 118 we had until December 30th to both spend and spend all the money and receive all of the materials that we bought. So that really made it tough because so many districts nationwide obviously were buying things like technology, you know, Chromebooks by the millions. And so as a result of that, a lot of these things were back ordered. Uh, so we've been very fortunate actually to get all of these items in before the deadline. And, and you know, I mean, it, it really kind of influenced things like, you know, where we could buy things from and what items we could buy. And now we're really kind of waiting for the final word on this, but it, it looks like these two grants may be at the 11th hour be extended to June 30th, which at this point in time won't really affect Hadley because we've spent it all. But um, it's just one of those things that, you know, all along, School business managers, uh, the, the finance people at DESE, um, I know superintendents were pulling their hair out on this, you know, just to, why would they stop this thing on December 30th? And it looks like sometime this week, we may get word um, that now you have until the end of the school year to spend it. So again, while it doesn't affect Hadley, it, it is a, you know certainly good news for other school districts around here. Um, and the other grants you can see, you know, there's nothing in Circuit Breaker that's been spent. We did transfer some expenses over to the 240 Special Ed Grant. Um, a little bit more to Title I and Title IV. Early Childhood is a small grant. I usually do that kind of on a quarterly basis. I might even just do it in three phases this year of about $1,200 per phase just to transfer expenses. Those would actually be transferred from the preschool revolving account to the 262 grant because the person that gets paid for it is being paid out of early childhood revolving right now. So it's a little bit of a help for that particular account. We'll end up moving $3,700 of expenses out of there. Um, and the other two grants at this point in time uh, have not had anything expended from them. So uh, that's pretty much where we stand on the grants. I don't know if there's any questions on those. Nope. Nothing. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, anything else that anyone might have a question on? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, Chris. It. Thanks, Chris. Any personnel report? Uh, yes. Uh, Paul Marcinek has been named as the long term sub for the remainder of the year. He has been substituting in mathematics and he will continue in that role through the end of the school year. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, school committee reports will be our next meeting. Uh, we do have some action items on warrants still remaining. Uh, is there a motion to approve the accounts payable warrants that were submitted in, the no in November 2020? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. I will abstain. Uh, is there a motion to approve the warrants submitted in November 2020? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we got the November 5th and November 19th minutes. Any revisions, clarifications? Okay. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, great. Thank you. So next meeting dates, we talked about an executive session on Monday <coughs> mm -hmm. at 530. But what else do we have? Anything on the calendar yet? <laughs> we don't for January. Um, 
although I would suggest uh, January 4th, that Monday, that discussion regarding athletics, like the week before the athletics, uh, it's scheduled to begin on January 11th, right? So minimally, we assume that we'll meet an executive session next Monday that's specifically uh, executive session for the purpose of uh, discussing strategy with uh, relative to contract uh, negotiations, excuse me. And um, then January 4th, um, minimally a regular school committee meeting to discuss uh, athletics and remote. When we're remote or proceeding with athletics, like an athletic Okay, does Monday the 4th work for everybody? Yeah. Are we yes. doing 5, 5.30? Is that still okay? We'll yeah. make sure we advertise that, as you said, that people are well aware that that discussion will take place on that day. I know this is an important topic for people. Any, will there be an executive session at that meeting? Um, we, uh, if we want to do any planning for um, negotiations, then you could afterwards. Is that what you're asking for, Humera? I think you and I had a discussion about. Uh... Right, so as we prepare for, I will add it to that agenda in preparation for negotiations, yeah. Because you you'd suggested that maybe yeah. there would be a meeting on the 8th, but if it's on the 4th, I didn't know if you were moving the. Yeah. Okay, yep. Back. Okay, so we'll add the exact uh, um, uh, meeting to the agenda. And if we don't need that exact session, we can cancel that for the fourth yeah. all right yeah. and then what are do we have other regular meetings in january that we need to establish now? Uh, i think we were just planning on uh scheduling um scheduling every uh monday um but every other meeting would be a regular meeting so those data meetings would be there um, and if there's a need, we could always cancel those. Am I, am I making something nice for that? Remember the discussion was yeah. that there would be um, no more than two regular meetings and the other meetings would be data meetings. So I would just ask people to, except for, I will assume on the holiday that we're not gonna meet. So the Mondays in January, except January 18th. Sure. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. When you send those out, can you just somehow annotate which ones are regular and yeah. which ones are, you know? Yeah. I will. Data. Yeah, just in case, <laughs> just to know what I need to plan on. Yes, I will. And then if I could just before you adjourn, just very quickly make sure I got everything. So I have a summary of the things that were agreed upon, approval of the crosswalk, ensuring that we talk about any permitting needs um, for the crosswalk for GSA. That week of 1-4, all learners will be remote. If the data on January 7 uh, demonstrate that both community transmission thresholds have been exceeded, then the week of 1-11, we would continue with remote. Um, there is uh, preliminary approval of phase three as presented with the understanding that Ms. Camuto will return in front of the school committee with more details about the transitioning from phase two to phase three. Um, you approve the community foundation grant, the donation drive. Um, I will put together that survey around cleanliness and protocols. We'll look at something around checking in on the overall well being of folks. And for follow up, 1228 is an executive session. 1 4 is our discussion, a regular meeting, a discussion of athletics. We'll just hold all Mondays for meetings except for Martin Luther King. And at some point at a future meeting, in response to the public comment, we will report on specific actions that we've taken to support the school committee resolution of anti-racism and uh, what evidence we have of ongo our ongoing commitment to said resolution. Um, and in January, Ms. Kamisa will return with uh, tweaks to transitioning from phase two to phase three. I think that's everything for tonight. You got it, Annie. Right. Awesome. Well, I hope everybody has a really wonderful holiday. Oh, yeah. Happy holiday. Are we need a motion to adjourn? Yep. Motion to adjourn. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Aye.
Have a good night, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Happy holidays. Yeah.